Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. Just like that. Okay, good morning everyone um, and welcome to the, the 21st meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, due to ongoing going safeguarding measures in place um, in regards to COVID-19, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via teleconference. Um, witnesses will also be beaten, uh, briefing the committee via teleconference. The meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. Um, members can mute their tablets by pressing the F4 button on their device. Um, apologies then, this morning we have apologies from Stuart Dixon um, due to ongoing illness. I don't think we have any other. No, um, other there. members are on the line. Um, okay. And we're hoping um, Christopher will be along later on. Okay. Um, then moving on to item number two, draft minutes. Uh, there is a copy of the draft minutes from last week's meeting on the 3rd of June at page five of the packs. Are members content that the minutes are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Great. Great. Thank you. Okay. Item number three, then, um, chairperson's business. Um, members may have seen the um, article in this morning's Telegraph around the, the hardship fund, that there is um, something like 2,900 applicants to the hardship fund. I think we were expecting many more applicants to that, and we had also asked for the figures last week, and I don't believe we've received Not yet, those no, yet chair. from the department. Not yet. Um, obviously, the, you know, given the, um, I suppose, the ongoing issues there have been with people who've been excluded from the, the hardship fund, um, it maybe would be useful for us to again highlight the likes of the sole traders, um, other... Entertainment and leisure chair have still, um, a lot of them are, are not getting any kind of help, so I've, I'm still getting emails from uh, them. Yeah, small manufacturing as small well, manufacturing, yeah. child care, um, obviously the charity fund has now been announced, but we're yes. still waiting on the criteria for that to see where social enterprise will fit in. Yeah. Um, so is that something we can take up? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, again? absolutely. Um, and also lots of members will be being contacted <coughs> by various different types of businesses, the likes of estate agents, surveyors, different people wondering where in the recovery plan that they fit. We have been passing all of that information to the Minister and the Department and the yeah, sure everything forum. we have, yeah, um, we've passed on. Um, that's the thing, I think, Chair, that a lot of the, the contact I'm getting is um, members will, will probably get exactly the same as, where do I fit into that? I've got an on-street entrance, but can I now open because I'm you know, slightly bigger than a small shop, and it has been confusing. I think uh, a lot of people saw the opening of Debenhams yeah. and, and weren't really sure whether that fitted into um, non-essential small shop. The, 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 the phrase small shop has been used a lot, and I think people are really confused about what that actually means, so clarification on that would be, can I, would be helpful. Can I be selfish and ask when our constituency office is about to open again? If you have a street entrance and it's relatively small, I, I'm telling people to <laughs> open up and see what happens. Mm -hmm. That's probably the wrong thing. I do have a street entrance in my unit. That should be small, fine. So. It should be fine. Like, right, I so if I get prosecuted, I'll blame you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> um, chair, just on the charity. It's, 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 it's similar setup to a state agent. Right. And, and you've got a. Huh. Most have a, a counter. Shop front. Yeah, yeah. Counter, yeah. yeah. There was some guidance issued yesterday about health and safety in the office right. um, from from the COVID-19 working group in the Assembly, so you just you, you maybe see I'll read that. I'll, do you want to track that down? Yeah. I'll send yeah. it round. Your fellow steward who should done? Yeah, aye. Um, Gordon, are you looking in? Yeah, just on the, um, the charities funding, can we get some of the clarification on the, de the Department of Communities about that? Who's eligible? The amount of money. Yeah, no criteria. Yeah. Yeah. Criteria hasn't been published. It's opening on Monday, and the criteria will be published then. I think is what it said on the the press release. As soon get, as we get eyes on that, chair, we circulate it. Okay. Do you have any idea how much money is involved? I think it's fifteen, 15 and a half million. Uh, fifteen and a half million. I think that's what it said. Can we get clarification then on that, please? Do right. I talk and to thank the you. Committee's clerk. Yep. Great. Okay then, um, we'll move on to item number four, which is our briefing this morning from Belfast Chamber Retail NI and NI Retail Consortium on the way back for retail. Um, there is a briefing from NI Retail Consortium at page 13 of your pack. Um, and on the line we have uh, Simon Hamilton, Chief Executive of Belfast Chamber, Ben Roberts, Chief Executive of Retail NI, and Aidan Connolly, Director of the, um, NI Retail Consortium. 
Um, are you, if you guys would go ahead and make an opening statement and then we'll open it up to members for questions. Not required. Gentlemen, are you there? Yes, we are. Uh, Peter Simon here. Um, yeah. So I, I, sure. Thank you very much. I, I'll kick off um, if that's okay. Um, look, I, I think really appreciate um, the opportunity to to appear before the committee today and, and give evidence on on the retail sector. Um, for those who don't know, Belfast Chamber would have considerable number of our members would be retailers of all different um, sizes, both multiples and independents, um, located not just uh, in Belfast City Centre, but but right across the, the city. Um, uh, it has undoubtedly been one of the sectors that has been hardest hit as a result of um, the restrictions imposed to, to stop the spread of, of, of COVID-19. Um, many, many, many of our retail members have been closed down uh, completely um, over this period, uh, and obviously that has had a huge impact on uh, those businesses. Things have, have perhaps somewhat moved on and, and moved on publicly, um, positively since uh, we collectively published our, our, our fighting back document. Um, retail has, or a lot of retail certainly has a lot more certainty now uh, around when it can reopen, um, but there are still some issues both short-term uh, and long-term, that I think are worth focusing on. Um, in terms of particularly in, in the short-term, uh, obviously from Friday, all non-essential retailers um, can reopen again, with the exception of those that are in shopping centres. Uh, I think indoor shopping centres should also be given a date when they can reopen. It is the reality, and, and many members will, will know this from experience in their own areas, that uh, indoor shopping centres are already open and they're already open safely. Um, I'm aware of one of our members in um, the city who have 60% of their uh, shops because they were deemed essential retail that are actually open. So they're well experienced, well versed in how to open safely, how to uh, keep their premises clean and safe and also to have queuing systems in place. So we would we would urge the executive to also set a date for indoor shopping centres to, to open up uh, as well. Uh, in, in terms of, the, I suppose, the more you know, longer-term impact of, of all of this on retail, obviously it's a, it's a sector that was hugely challenged all, already before we went into to this crisis. Um, it has been a period where uh, ONS statistics show that retail sales were down by 18%, one of the biggest falls I think ever. Fashion retail in particular was down by over 50%. Um, footfall has been depressed and will undoubtedly be continue to be depressed for quite some time to come. And we're moving into what for many retailers is actually quite a, a dangerous period. And, and whilst they want to reopen and have been looking to reopen, they've been closed for nearly three months and they, and they want to get trading again in a way that's safe for, for their staff and safe for their customers. Opening up again with all of the, the costs that that will bring um, but with footfall down, actually, is going to be quite difficult for for many trainers in um, in retail and indeed in, in other sectors as well as they start to to open up. So that's why we're calling for that that kind of tapering off of support. The rates holiday is very very welcome for the retail sector, but um, I think there is a need to look at you know ongoing support as these challenges continue. Um, the sector will need ongoing support too in terms of accessibility of city centres, town centres and high streets and how people can get in, both the staff and customers can, can get in safely. Safely, I think it's also an opportunity to look at revitalising our city centres and our high streets and our region has fallen behind elsewhere in terms of um, schemes like the Future High Streets Fund, which is pumping a billion pounds into to high streets and city centres across um, uh, England. I, I think there's, there's a, a real need for was almost ownership of, of the sector a little bit as well you know there, there is it is a sector which doesn't really have uh, any sense of sort of ownership at a, at a storm level and I think if we all value and I think we do and I know from from conversations with, with many members that they do value the importance of retail as part of a mix that includes residential and office and cultural uh, and tourism and hospitality and leisure um, that you know, that's what the future of, of our city centres and our high streets are, are going to be all about, having that, that mix. And 
um, I think people do value that. So we're going to have to invest in that sector and take some degree of, of ownership of how it succeeds in the longer term. And just finally, Chair, when I mentioned hospitality, leisure and, and tourism, it would be remiss, I think, if I, I didn't mention the need to um, offer some hope to that sector as well in terms of uh, reopening Belfast Chamber as many members within those sectors as well. Um, as I said, the future success of city centres and high streets is all about experiences and, and hospitality, leisure and tourism are, are at the centre of that. There's a real symbiotic relationship between retail and hospitality, leisure and tourism. So those sectors need reopening dates too, particularly with um, our neighbours to the south moving forward as well. Um, I think we don't want to see those sectors here in our region falling behind um, others. So um, we would encourage uh, the setting of, of reopening dates for those sectors as well. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Uh, it's Aidan here. Um, uh, one of the uh, problems of letting Simon go first is that he uh, takes all the good points you discussed this morning. Um, the, uh, yeah, uh, the, there's a lot of, 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 of what Simon says completely resonates with what we're doing. Um, the, firstly, can I say thank you to the committee um, for your efforts since the last time we spoke. Um, you have gone to bat uh, for us as far as asking the questions about reopening safely. Um, that's not only uh, being noted at the executive, but within our membership as, uh, as well. So I, I thank you for that work. Um, we have, as we said uh, at the last time we were talking, you had that focus on safety as a guide to reopening. And retailers have been working very hard to, to get ready to reopen. And I think it's a testament to their hard work that the executive has now seen fit to allow uh, them to open by, by Friday. The only sort of missing piece in the retail jigsaw is the shopping centres and as Simon said a lot are already open for essential retailers and it seems a little bit arbitrary now that it isn't actually uh, open um, especially since a lot of them um, have gone that extra mile to ensure the safety of, of staff and, and customers including social distancing and PPE and, and, and hand sanitisation um, which has been uh, needed so we, we really do need that final piece of the retail jigsaw um, to be opened um, as soon as possible, or at least a, a date for, for allowing it um, to, to open so that um, we can start to get things up and running. As far as the financial support, again, tapering off is, is, is the way forward. Even whenever we have all of retail open, it won't be open in the same capacity. Our footfall is going to be decimated. Um, and it's, it's not going, we're not going to have the ability to take all staff back at once. It's going to be a, a, a protracted process so that we're able to do it, uh, not only safely, but financially viably, uh, as well. Um, on wider support, I think the big thing for us is, um, getting shoppers to and through our towns and cities. Now, that's going to need a joined-up approach because the Department of Infrastructure uh, looks after the, the, the footpath, the, the local council looks after the, the cityscapes, um, and the, the PS and I are going to have to be in, in, involved as well. There's going to be a friction there between queuing areas outside and pedestrian movement, and we need to, to get this right. Um, it's not enough for us to say that it's safe. We have to imbue the public with a bit of confidence. Now, there's two ways of doing that. One is to not only say that it's safe, but show that it's safe. So that signage, that things like hand sanitization, that things like um, making it easier for them to, to get through uh, to and through the towns. Uh, but as well as, as the, 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 the signage and, and that part, we also need um, some clear guidance, um, should that come from the public health agency or from the executive, on what personal responsibilities are, you know, unequivocal guidance about the new normal of shopping, and to encourage them uh, to go back to our, 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 our shopping destinations and, and to help the economy uh, grow again. For the councils to do that, they're going to need uh, support to deliver safe public spaces, and that means that we need a scheme for safely reopening our high streets, uh, like that has been, that has been announced, the 50 million that was announced for for England. We haven't heard anything like that uh, in Northern Ireland yet. To reiterate the point um, about the symbiotic relation between retail, hospitality, and leisure, it was said to me uh, at the start of the week by one of the, of the uh, uh, one of our members that uh, having half a high street open 
um, is not good enough, uh, quite simply because we have that symbiotic relationship. We are uh, a reliant on uh, footfall and impulse buys that come uh, from people going to hospitality uh, and leisure. There's still huge challenges out there, um, which I've, some of which I've, I've outlined uh, there now, but um, we are in a better position than we were. It's still going to be a very, very rocky 2020. Um, but as far as the short term, that, that's really where we are as far as the need to get all of retail reopened to make sure that financial support is, is uh, tapered off rather than full stop. And most of all, that, that partnership approach. In the future, we're going to need to look at how uh, the high street is going to look in, in, in six months, a year, two years down the line. Um, this COVID situation hasn't um, really created a new dynamic. What it's done is accelerate dynamics that have been there before. That means we're going to have to work harder and work smarter to get people to come to our retail destinations and spend their time as well as their money. That's a conversation perhaps for, uh, for, for another day, but it would be remiss of me if I didn't flag it with you now. Thank you. Chair, uh, uh, Lynn Roberts here. Um, obviously going third is even more of a difficulty, but uh, I will I will never do my best. Listen, just a, a couple of things. Obviously, since we last talked to the committee, we have obviously the reopening plan and the date in place, and that is welcome. But I think there's a couple of things in terms of of policy challenges and the solutions that need to be looked at. I think the first one, and this takes upon what Aidan said about making sure we can safely reopen our town centres and high streets. We do need a, a sort of comprehensive plan to do, to do that, to make sure that there is the right health and safety guidance for retailers, key businesses and town centres, uh, and obviously employees and consumers. You know, and this will obviously involve as was reimagining re public spaces uh, as well. But we, so we've been sort of talking to the Department of Communities uh, and other stakeholders about in developing a plan because, you know, we have all these reopening dates. Retailers are working very hard to reopen. But unless consumers have the confidence to go back to the high streets, then you know, we're going to have ongoing problems. So it's important that we get, if you like, the physical environment in our high streets and town centres, right, and we need a plan. Uh, to make sure that that uh, is as safe as possible. And obviously, you've got uh, organisations like the Dublin City Centre Bed, UK High Streets Task Force, the Department of Communities and Local Government, who has a lot of those plans uh, in place. I think the other thing that we've been sort of picking up since we got the announcement this week uh, about reopening Friday is childcare. And, you know, that's not just unique to the retail sector. As the economy begins to reopen, on a more comprehensive basis, this will become a huge issue. Um, so it's absolutely vital that we see more private sector crashes, child care facilities uh, opening up. Um, with the, the notice given this week, you know, we have a lot of uh, members telling us that staff having to make child care arrangements uh, has proved a, a huge challenge. The grandparents obviously in place, it's even more uh, of a challenge. And I suppose the, the third aspect to all of this is, and I suppose it's the last bit of the jigsaw to some degree in relation to the small business grants, and that is the grants for multi-site uh, retailers. Um, it's something we're raising. We've meeting with the minister directly after this presentation, so if, if I have to leave early, I'm sure you'll understand. But you know, given that Northern Ireland is the only part of the UK which the multi-site grants do not apply, and if you're a retailer that has two, three, or four stores, that's two, three, four sets of overheads. And if you haven't had any income over the past few months and you're reopening this week or early next week uh, and you don't have those sort of grants in place to help you pay for uh, a lot of the measures in place, the perspex screens, retrofitting stores, that's a big challenge. And it's a big financial strain as well. So we're still continuing to push. I know, Chair, I appreciate your support on this in relation to the, the multi-site grants. We really do need to see uh, the Department of the Economy move on this issue uh, and to support those multi-site retailers as they begin, the, the, obviously, the long road back. But overall, I, th I do believe that we are making good progress. I think there are a few things that we need to do, but it will be a very, very long road back. Um, and, you know, the, the big ticket, is, I suppose, that, that if 
we are in the midst of a very serious recession over the next few months and in possibly years. What impact that will have on consumer confidence and consumer spending is a whole other issue. But for the time being, we're, we've made good progress this week. We have a bit more to do. Uh, I think we absolutely do need to see a date set for the hospitality sector. Um, retail and hospitality are two sides of the same coin. Uh, so it's absolutely vital that we get that date. Uh, and uh, we look forward, obviously, to what the executive uh, will set out tomorrow. Thank you. Very much for, for all of that. It's been very helpful. Um, and I guess all of us would recognise the, the measures that have been put in place by retailers in, in terms of safety and, and protecting the health and safety um, of the public so far. Um, so all of that is really important. You mentioned, I suppose, the, the partnership approach that's going to be required um, in terms of reopening. In terms of conversations that are happening in relation to that between you know, the likes of yourselves as representative bodies um, and local government and other agencies, um, the Department for Infrastructure in particular, and the PSNA, is, is there a coordinated approach to that? So there's lots of various conversations uh, happening. So um, myself and uh, Glenn are on a call every uh, fortnight with the, the PSNI and, and, and their command team on the COVID uh, crisis. Um, I've spoken to, to Nilga about that. I think we're at the stage now where those um, in the round conversations need to be uh, more strategically placed. I think this is going to come at us very, very quickly. Um, so, uh, you know, by, by the start of next week, we would need to be sitting down with someone from the Department of Communities, Department of Infrastructure, Nilga, PSNI, and the, the three bodies you have around the, 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 on, on the, the phone today um, to, to make it happen because th this is now, you know, we are in the process of opening by, by early next week, I'm sure that, um, you know, we'll have the majority of places uh, open. That then means that there is an immediate problem. So those, um, those conversations need to move from, from sort of round robin uh, to strategic uh, positioning very, very quickly. And I think, Chair, just to follow up, we've actually suggested um, an informal advisory group made up of the relevant executive department, council, obviously, or three organizations, uh, and other sort of key stakeholders. Um, and I think that this is something the communities minister is, is looking at, uh, given that the, the communities department has the strategic uh, policy role with town centers and obviously the local government remit as well. I don't think there's a huge amount of work to be done on this, but I think if we have almost as near as we can an off-the-shelf plan for town centres, high streets, uh, I think so much the better because ultimately, you know, this is all about giving consumers the confidence to return to their high streets, to return to, uh, obviously, uh, their, their town centres. And so we've got to ensure that um, they're safe as possible, that we address issues around multiple queuing in streets, um, you know, it will make change. Obviously, there's issues around public transport. There's going to be issues around sort of deep cleaning, sanitising, stewarding, signage, a whole range of issues that cross a number of departments. Uh, and obviously, councils have the responsibility uh, for that as well. So I think that is a short-term challenge. I don't think it's an impossible thing to do. Um, uh, but I do think if we can get something akin to a, a, a working plan, within the next two weeks. I think that would greatly help this process and move us on considerably. Uh, okay. uh, Chair, I, I, I agree with what has been said. For, from a, I suppose particularly from a kind of Belfast um, perspective, um, there have been a considerable number of conversations to try to coordinate this work and, and to get it quite right. And I would um, praise particularly Belfast City Council for sort of stepping forward, trying to take a coordinating role in all of this. And I'm sure that similar has been replicated across Northern Ireland. Um, the, one of the, I don't want this to sound um, as if we're sort of ungrateful for the slightly earlier dates that we were, we were given for reopening, but one of the reasons why ourselves and, and Aidan and Glenn and others were, were calling for a date to be set um, was to give notice, not just to the retailers themselves, but to all of those stakeholders uh, that have been mentioned, whether that's local councils or the Department for the Communities, Department for Infrastructure or the Police, um, to have time to consider all of this very carefully. And I think good work has been done 
in the time that had limited time that has been available. Ian is absolutely right. We're now heading very quickly to a position where um, pretty much all of the city centre, all of the high streets are, are going to be open again. So, so those, that work is going to have to be accelerated. I, I think that you know we've seen examples from other cities around the world where there have been quite imaginative responses, um, and um, I think that's been really, really positive. I think part of the difficulty in replicating that here is the sort of disjointed nature of city or local government and then sort of central government departments. And that perhaps doesn't, um, as we will all know from different experiences, then um, contribute towards sort of fast, rapid response in situations like this. I think the response has been in very difficult circumstances, has been very good and has been as quick as it can be. Um, but I do think that, you know, we're going to have to work around um, those, that sort of disconnect to ensure that we get all of these things right, um, not just in the short term, but, but moving forward as well. And that's something that we, we will take up just um, from today's meeting in relation to that coordinated <coughs> approach to um, the, the the reopening and how all of that looks in terms of our, our city and town centres. Because um, I, I also agree that the, the messaging around it in terms of um, reinforcing public confidence to go back out and about is going to be really important. Um, and yet you've mentioned there, Simon, um, imaginative solutions um, to you know reopening and everything within our, our, our city and town centres. Um, the kind of approaches that we've seen in some of the other cities where you know we have that kind of cafe culture um, is something obviously we'd like to see emulated here as well. Um, you see, in relation to that, you, you mentioned talking to the Belfast City Council around it. Um, what what is the particular issues around that? As I understand, some guidance is, is needed. Yeah, there's there's, there's, there's there's kind of two fronts here where where um, this has been looked at, and it, it's kind of it crosses both council and Department for Communities and um, Department for Infrastructure. Um, there there is a, I mean. Pavement cafe legislation, as it was called, was passed some time ago through the assembly, um, and hasn't um, been uniformly or well implemented uh, across Northern Ireland. So, I think you know that I've had some conversations with the city council around, you know, accelerating that, doing you know, doing a even a sort of temporary workaround to allow the, that to happen. Because, I mean, the, the important point here is that you know, for particularly for hospitality businesses, the <laughs> You know they are going to have restrictions on the number of people that they can serve inside their premises for probably quite some time. So getting space, whether that's on the pavement or in parking bays, which obviously takes us into the domain of of the Department for Infrastructure, um, that's that's about creating that space to allow them to you know become a viable business moving forward. I mentioned earlier that it's a dangerous period for for many businesses, and you know ensuring that there's a bit of viability where they can expand their uh, footprint out onto, you know, safely, obviously, into uh, adjoining pavements or into parking bays. So this is something that, uh, or even in, in, in terms of, like, and this would be relevant to DFC as well as the council and DFI, um, spaces which could be designated as sort of almost like hospitality zones. So if people are taking away food because they can't eat it in premises, then they can maybe go to an area which is sort of safely laid out um, for the consumption of, of, of whatever it is. So, you know, th th those are ideas to put out there, conversations that we had locally in Belfast about that. I'm sure it's happening elsewhere and what's happening. Um, um, other bodies, other organisations are having those. But, you know, it, it does require some of those departments to step forward and take a bit of kind of ownership of it and to make it happen, even if that's for a temporary short-term basis to get us through this. And then perhaps, you know, we'll see in the longer term if it works, if it's good for business uh, and it doesn't um, impede pedestrians or anything like that, then it's maybe something that we can actually solidify in the longer term too. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, Sinead? Oh, thank you very much uh, for that briefing. And um, I suppose sound a little bit more upbeat um, than the last time we spoke. Uh, at least now there's there's a sense of, of, of direction of travel. Um, just back on to that, um, I suppose, working within the, the pavements and, uh, and having hospitality zones. Is, is there legislation required regarding drinking and consuming alcohol outside uh, as well? Or where are we with that? 
I think, um, sorry, Chair, I think that, you know, there are probably, um, there are others who would probably better be better versed in terms of um, the alcohol legislation aspect of all of this. So I'll not venture into that unless I say something wrong. I do, what I think I do know is the, the pavement cafe legislation extends the license out to, you know, wherever the, the sort of infrastructure that the chairs and the seats and the tables would be out onto the pavement. But, you know, some of this isn't actually even about, you know, sort of um, alcohol consumption. You know, it's even for sort of takeaway food. And, and there are some of those that I know in Belfast City Centre that are planning to open up in the next number of, of days and weeks. Uh, and rather than have people maybe moving around the city, consuming that food, I think it would be good to be able to put either outside the premises themselves or in sort of nearby public spaces, safe areas where people can consume that food and therefore, you know, deal with the waste that would come with that, deal with, you know, sort of, um, you know, ha have, it, have it in an area rather than spread out all around the city centre, for example, and I'm sure that would be the same across other towns as well. Yeah. And yeah, I think, Jeanette, one of the, one of the yeah, you highlight a, a wider problem which was there long before this crisis, there are so many players in relation to our town and city centres, both in terms of government, uh, you know, government at the executive level and council. So, for instance, take, for instance, the Department of Infrastructure. Um, they have responsibility for on-street car parking and council responsibility for off-street. So, um, likewise, you have a, the, the regeneration powers are still not devolved to the councils. They're still with the Department of Community. So, again, uh, you know, so you're putting, there's an awful lot of players around that table in order to get a coherent approach to town centre regeneration. And this is, you know, 12 years in this job, you know, I've seen this from day one. It's always been a challenge to do that. So I think one of the things uh, possibly the Assembly could look to try and fast track is sort of ensuring that the regeneration powers go to the councils. Uh, they transfer things like, uh, you know, on-street car parking to the council. So it means that the councils can make some of these decisions uh, and in relation to, uh, you know, making our town and city centres fit for purpose, particularly, uh, you know, as we begin that sort of long road back. So I do think that, you know, that's something that I know Nilga has been calling for uh, some time. I think it, it now needs to be sort of fast-tracked uh, to ensure that, you know, that councils are more nimble and can respond quicker. quicker. Uh, Glenn there because everybody you know all councils know their own areas some streets uh, I suppose in, in Derry city centre are quite narrow uh, and we're going to be challenged uh, with the queuing and pedestrians and traffic as well uh, and there's a safety uh, element within that um, so it is a challenge going forward but I think that we can get solutions and I do think that this is now an opportunity to do, uh, to do improvements within our town centre that were long overdue uh, to make it a more pleasant experience coming into the town centre to shop and, and enjoy the hospitality and leisure um, <coughs> and maybe in a more relaxed um, manner as well. So thank you very much. John Stewart. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, gentlemen, for your presentation so far. Uh, very enlightening and I think it is good that we've moved on significantly since the last time you briefed us. Um, as always, I have no doubt that the sectors you represent will go above and beyond in terms of implementing the necessary safety measures and things to protect the public and their, and their uh, staff as well, and to hopefully get the, um, the you know, retail and trade in our town centres and city centres up and running as quickly as possible. Uh, we just make a few points. Glenn, you refer to childcare, and I think this is key to economic recovery. Um, most of us are on record saying this from the start. We're heading towards a perfect storm here with schools potentially finishing for the summer, Grandparents still in, lock, in lockdown themselves or isolation and limited access to childcare. So it is a circle we need to, or square we need to circle or whatever you want to say as quickly as possible because otherwise I don't think employees are going to be able to get the time off that they need and that's going to put pressure on them, the employers. So I think collectively the executive needs to get that squared as quickly as possible. Um, Aidan, you referred to the, about having half a high street, and I totally agree. Um, hospitality is key to that, but one of the linchpins that I see to that in our towns, villages and cities is the health and beauty sector, and there, are no, there is no clarity whatsoever for that. And I know it's certainly in Carrick, Fergus and Larne, where I'm representing, every other store or shop and premises is either a nail bar or a tan studio or a hairdresser's, and they are vital... <laughs> <laughs> I need fake tan. <laughs> um, but they are vital, as you'll agree, to footfall. 
and providing the support in the footfall that then benefits the retailers who are selling the rest of the products. So um, I don't know what you're getting from your members, but I think we do need some clarity and guidance for them to get open as quickly as possible as well. And the final thing I'll say is, um, I'm interested to hear what your thoughts on this are. I'm getting the ambiguity about guidelines and different interpretations from the 11 councils being handed down then from the executive. So we've got ambiguity around announcements and what qualifies as a small shop versus medium. And then you've got 11 councils cutting their own detail, deciding which sector can open and under what criteria. It's not helpful. And are you getting the same sort of feedback? And do we need to do more? Does the executive need to do more to get that sorted? Thanks, guys. <laughs> on the uh, on what the councils are doing, I think the, the biggest problem in all of this is that this is completely new uh, to everyone. Um, you know, we have never in my lifetime gone through uh, something like this. Um, yes, there was things like SARS before and, and, and that sort of thing, but it was never anything on on the scale. So, um, I think people are, are are trying to to do their best. I think that the biggest sort of um, uh, problem that there's been is that the guidelines that have come out about reopening have been uh, somewhat ambiguous um, and uh, you've had some people champ in their arm, you've had other people who are adhering to the, not only the, the, the spirit of the law but the, the, the letter of the regulations as well and I, I think there is that sort of um, yeah, th there's been that sort of friction uh, but now that we are getting to the point where you know where the majority of retail is in the process of opening and hopefully we will see that decision on shop center uh, our shopping center soon um then that that friction will will be gone that then brings the the other friction which is how to uh, continue to, to to do that safely i think you're absolutely correct in saying that if we have uh, lots of different approaches from lots of uh, from the 11 different councils um then that makes it hugely difficult for uh, retailers and other businesses um, to ad adhere. And you got to remember that especially if, if they are multiple stores, they will be getting uh, different uh, messages uh, across Northern Ireland, and that's, that's not helpful. I think what we have said uh, from the start, um, should it be councils or the executive talking to businesses or councils and the executive talking to individual uh, householders um, we need absolute clarity, uh, unambiguous uh, 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 advice, and, and I think um, there's still a, a, an education piece uh, to be done um, with the public to explain to them what the new normal uh, will, will be. The more that that education piece is the same across Northern Ireland, uh, then the better it will be for, for both business and the public. I, I would um, reiterate what, what Aidan has said, and, oh, and, and I should have said on, on, on health and beauty matter, John, good to see you're rocking the uh, the ginger beard. Um, <laughs> you, you, you are my style icon, you know. <laughs> we, st we, st we still have a bit of, bit of a way to go, John, before we're, uh, we can match Mr O'Dowd or, or Aidan, in fact. Um, I'm African but, um, sunset, by the way. But... There, there is a... There, there, Aidan pointed absolutely right around... Um, Consistency, you know, and, and, and then like if you have different or inconsistent interpretations, let's say, you know, that, that might incur cost for, for some shops in some locations that they wouldn't have elsewhere. And, you know, fund, fundamentally, retailers want to do what's right. You know, they want to open safely for their staff, they want to open safely for their customers, they want to get going again. Uh, they don't want to do things wrongly or even be perceived as being doing things wrongly. Uh, and this is all very much a, a sort of a, a learning experience for, for everybody. But there, thankfully, there is learning that we can take from from elsewhere, um, where um, stores are open, uh, and indeed from the food sector here in, in in Northern Ireland, which has been open throughout all of this. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I think the clearer and the more consistent that that guidance is, so that it doesn't leave room for interpretation, which might then actually work against retailers, both in terms of cost and, and their ability, maybe in viability and opening. I think the more the more consistent that it is, the clearer it is, I think the better. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much, gentlemen, Simon, Glenn and Aidan. I think that we're very fortunate of the three wise men from retail with us this morning again. <laughs> the... Uh, all three different characters we, we all know very well. And we do appreciate the work you have done in difficult times. 
And I understand shopping centres will be on the agenda tomorrow at the Executive, and I think we all appreciate that there was a need for stage opening there. And I'm sure we're all aware of the push there has been. I know I've been lobbied about phone shops was one issue that needed clarification. Glenn, on the point about multi-sites, and I think we're all sympathetic, it's been raised here. Have you any idea of the cost of that to the Executive, and what would your proposals be on how that would be managed in relation to... Uh, we, as in Scotland, I understand they had a scheme where the, the first got a full payment and the second is 75. Would you see that there'd be perhaps an incremental uh, system put in place? That's question two. The other point yeah. is re reference uh, the big issue about social distancing. At the moment it's two metres and that's the recommendation from all the various health uh, organisations. Um, but I understand that in many cases, in some countries, it has been reduced to one metre. How do you see that uh, working out and the significance of that? I think we all appreciate that the difficulty that there is going to be for businesses having to maintain a two metre distance in, in a restaurant or a cafe. We have even noticed it within the, the, the canteen here at Stormont, a two metre distance is not very sociable and you're sitting one on one, one end of the table and for restaurants to open with to manage that I think is virtually impossible. As a non-drinker I don't know how they would manage it in a pub. I, I think it would be extremely difficult to manage but it's certainly a real challenge and something I think I would like your opinion on. Uh, what, what? So there, there are the main, main three issues. Yeah, well, maybe if I could just answer your, to the chair, of course, uh, your, your points, Gordon. Um, I, I think that certainly we're, we would be very happy if we got the Scottish model of multi-site uh, grants. Um, and, you know, this is something that in a very few minutes' time I, I hope to talk to the economy minister about. I think it's particularly more pertinent now because many of those retailers are now reopening or preparation for reopening on Friday. Some actually probably more likely on Monday as well. So... And they're having to dole out a lot of money in terms of retrofitting their stores, making sure they've got perspex screens, training staff, uh, and all the rest. So there's considerable expense there. And many of these retailers have had no income over the last uh, few months at all. So I think it's crucially important that we do get this, we do get the, the multi-site. It's the last piece of the jigsaw. Um, and I think that, you know, perhaps it's something we, we need to tease out with the economy. Just because all of the grants now, I think most of them have closed, there's still ongoing ones there. How much is left? What hasn't been claimed? Um, what have we got left in the kitty, so to speak, in, in relation to, to be able to do something in that? There's also an important point there that's in the, in the, the, the document that in terms of the sort of high, high street or town centre re reopening safety funds, um, again, that needs to be looked at um, as well to you know, ensure that... that you know, councils and traders are able to do the, do that in a coherent way in cross town centres. In terms of the the, the one the one meter, um, I sort of put that out there in, in an article on the Telegraph yesterday. If it can be done in a safe way, I think it certainly needs to be looked at because you know it would make life a lot easier for retailers as well as hospitality if we were able to move from two meters to one meter in a safe way. But you know, we, we want to be very clear. We're not trying to bounce ministers into disregarding the medical advice. Everything we say is predicated on the medical advice. And do you know what? If we don't respect and adhere to the medical guidance, then consumers are not going to come into shops. They're not going to come into town centres. So we, we absolutely do get the medical advice. But if there's a safe way of moving from two to one, it should be should be looked at and should be implemented. I, I would, Chair, I would echo what, what Glenn has said completely around the, the two metre issue. And, and, and look, you know, obviously, he, as he said, it's absolutely right. We should be listening um, to best medical um, advice and science around all of this. I think it's worth noting that I think the World Health Organization's advice is that uh, one metre is, is sufficient. Uh, I think if that was possible and, and um, there was an authority here in, in Northern Ireland um, study this, as others are doing, I think um, the Republic of Ireland are, are currently looking at this issue. Um, if that was to be implemented, then certainly to go back to, to Mr. Dunn's question, it would make um, viability for many businesses, particularly those in the hospitality sector, a, a lot greater uh, and will help them massively through what's still going to be a very difficult trading period. Right, 
Thank you. The last <coughs> point, just about access to our towns and cities, is important where people get, you can get easy access and uh, car parking at a reasonable cost and available. I think those are important issues. We need to make our towns, cities, um, an attractive, safe place where people will have confidence to go and also easy, accessible. And um, I do think there there is a balance, and it's an important balance. Uh, there's certainly a very strong lobby for against the car, but there's also the fact that many people will be using the cars probably more because car sharing is still probably seen as a, as a, a bit of a risk. So I do honestly think that that balance needs to be looked at. Uh, there's, a, there's always a bit of a push for uh, people getting people out of their cars, and that's important. But the people of Northern Ireland in the main have cars, use them, spend a lot of money on them, and still uh, find it difficult to get access to, to car parks. So I think that, that issue is important. I know it's not directly your responsibility, but you do have influence. And you do lobby on it, and as we all do, but I think it's something that needs to be better kept in mind. Sorry, Church, if I could take my leave now, I have to, make, have to go with the economy minister. So um, thank you again for uh, hearing us again. I'm sure my two colleagues will uh, be able to uh, more than handle any awkward questions. Thank you. Thanks, right, Glenn. Glenn. Thank you. Okay. Um, Gary, are you on the line still? Yep. Gary? Yes, sorry, Chair, I, I missed that briefly. Uh, yeah, thanks, um, Simon, Maiden, and, and to Glenn for the presentation. Um, uh, uh, two questions, uh, many of which uh, have been covered, but uh, obviously we do welcome the fact that our economy is starting to reopen again, and that's to be encouraged. Uh, the downside, I suppose, of everything happening quicker maybe than, than what initially was anticipated uh, is the fact that there's less time uh, to prepare and, and less time to make sure that we can do the things within our city centres and town centres that we would envisage happening. People think that uh, and talk about an opportunity in all of this to, to reimagine the city centres, but to be realistic, I think that um, there's a huge amount of work in that. Uh, I'm not um, against it in any way. I just think that what we're hearing uh, today, I suppose, is um, the fact that th there are city centres that are looking at how they do things differently, but there are other areas where maybe they're just not um, up to the same um, up to the same level or at the same point. Uh, and, and Gordon touched on the fact that this this two metre to one metre issue is something that that I am getting raised with me uh, quite a lot. For example, one uh, local restaurant had spoken to me about the fact that. You know, if they go to reopen, they currently have a 200-seater restaurant. Uh, they will only be able to accommodate 30 uh, with the two-meter distance in rules. So that ultimately will lead to uh, a, a drop in profits, also a drop in um, the number of employees ultimately. So I, I think that that's a concern. Uh, the second thing is around the uh, managing um, pedestrians, managing queues of shoppers within our city centers. Uh, how do you envisage that happening? Do do you see a situation, you know, in terms of the responsibility for that, you know, do you see that just being like a voluntary type agreement, or do you foresee, um, you know, security companies, for example, having to be employed uh, to ensure that people, you know, follow follow the instructions? You know, how do you see that working? It it shouldn't need to have. Uh Sure, that they, they shouldn't need to have security companies, but they, uh, like everything else in this uh, virus, uh, we have seen, um, we've seen uh, the majority, the vast majority of people step up and do what is right. We have seen the vast majority of people stay indoors when they have to stay indoors, socially distance when they're outside. However, um, even within uh, shopping uh, areas and, and, and within stores, you know, there are people who don't abide the rules, don't abide by the one-way system, um, who become abusive at retail staff. Um, and, and it is terrible that we have to legislate for that minority, but um, our priority in this has to be um, has to be to protect the, 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 our, our staff and our, our, our consumers. That's why we need to have um, that joined up approach. We need to have 
uh, the uh, PSNI now they don't have to be stopping people from from going 30 miles or whatever and um, to be repurposing some of their resource to be more visible on the high street we need to have those conversations with the local councils because they know their local towns and, and cities better than anyone else and know where the push points we also need to be talking to people like the beds who again have a, a role to play and all this we need to make sure that it, there is signage we need to make sure that even for the short term if there is pedestrianization or those sort of things that that do happen, that it happens in a way that still allows retail deliveries to, to, to occur um, and that there is, you know, that there is a, an ability to queue um, without stopping every other part of, of, of traffic. So we need to look at our, 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 our streetscape as well. Part of that responsibility is local council, part of that responsibility is the Department for, for Infrastructure. So again, it goes back to that whole point of we need a delineation very quickly of responsibilities. We need some very clear messaging for the public that uh, abuse or, or, or messing up will not be tolerated. And we need um, very quickly to have signage to explain to people how it works. Uh, and we need all of this to happen in a very, very short time frame. Um, Chair, um, um, I agree with um, Ian's point around the management of, of, of queues. It, it, you know, it, what I think we, we don't want to see is it being sort of managed in any kind of heavy handed sort of a way. Um I don't think um I don't think that will be conducive to actually encouraging people to come into town centres and city centres again. Um uh, so we don't want a sort of a, a military operation style, you know, work on, you know, where it's like one way systems or crash barriers or things like that if, if that can be avoided. Um, I think supermarkets and other essential retailers have been open throughout the crisis and the stores have been very capable of, of, of managing queues. Now, I suppose the difference might be that in, in a lot of those cases, that's inside centres or retail parks or standalone supermarkets. This is this is about public space. So I do think that there is a need for you know signage and, and stenciling and there will be particular issues at, at, at maybe we could describe them as pinch points, you know, as, as the Deputy Chair mentioned, you know, we're where streets are narrow, um, so I think particular emphasis will be required in, in, in those areas to just to make those safe. Uh, I think the move from two meters to one meter would greatly help that if that if that was to happen. Um, uh, on 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 your point, Gary, around you know the reimagining of, of city centres and high streets. You know, I, I think I think you make a very very valid point, uh, and it is quite possible that the opportunity to do some of this to test this may have been missed, um, um, I suppose, because a combination of us was a good thing, which is the, the earlier opening up of city centres and, and, and high streets, uh, and perhaps not moving quickly enough on that sort of cross-agency, cross-departmental um, work that would have been required to do that. Yeah. No, thanks for that, Simon Aiden, and that's useful, and I completely support the idea. What we do not want to see is a situation where, you know, our signs and city centres turn into some sort of uh, sort of tight security operation. I think that that's, that's not what we want. We want people to be able to move uh, relatively freely, but we just trust that, that people will adhere to the rules. Uh, and I think that um, as a committee, there is we really need to gra gra grasp the fact that there needs to be that joint up thinking. And just concerned with the fact that the Friday, um, Friday we're talking about more stores opening, um, you know, shopping centres potentially opening in the very near future. Um, all of these things do need to be pulled together very quickly. Um, and I think maybe just as a committee, that's over to us. But I do want to thank you both for, uh, and Flynn as well, for all the work that you're doing, because uh, there's no doubt that, that that work has has forced the issue and forced um, a situation where we're able to uh, open things sensibly again. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think that that's a good point, because over the course of this crisis, we've been, like, we've been able to see where you know people are effectively self-policing and like stores have been you know using staff to to, mm. to do that so i think the, the the continuation of that is a would be the most natural thing um john o'dowd yeah uh, and thank you uh, for your presentation thus far and i add my thanks and uh commendation to your sales and also to the businesses you represent and the staff who have been working in them over this, la uh, this last number of weeks and months um, in fairness to them, they've done a terrific job in, in, in at times very difficult circumstances uh, and it has to be very worrying at times for them and their families but they stuck at it and fair play to them. 
And, and so that I just want to ask, in terms of, have you any idea, just speaking to your membership, in terms of job retention and, and job losses? Uh, I, it's probably too ambitious to talk about job creation, but uh, have you any idea or any percentage in terms of jobs lost in the sector over this last period of time? And what are your thoughts about uh, job creation moving forward? So within our, uh, we, we, so there's, everybody's been on furlough who, who has been closed at, at the moment. Um, we have had to employ extra uh, staff, um, the majority of which are on short-term contracts, and that's to backfill um, colleagues who have had to shield because either they or someone in their household um, is, is, is vulnerable, um, and, and that's been ongoing. We've also had to employ people um, because of the uh, growth of labour-intensive activities such as click and collect and delivery, so that's delivery drivers, people who actually pick uh, the, 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 the food for both click and collect and, and delivery. Um, and you know that that the the it all depends on what the um, how, how retail sort of regenerates now, um, as far as when you know they will uh, how long those contracts will will, will keep going. Um, however, the the big point in all this is we don't actually know and, and we won't know until the furlough ends um, how many jobs have actually. Uh, being lost. Now, the fact that the furlough is being tapered and that there is going to be a tapering off of, of that support is, is welcome. We need more of a tapering when it comes to uh, Northern Ireland and, and executive-only measures. But honestly, we won't know until come October, November time when we start seeing seeing the figures. Um, it's a real boon that we have been able to open so quickly after the last time we, 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 we spoke to you. Um, we need to trade to be able to keep jobs on. How we trade is also going to be, you know, how many staff is allowed in the shop, how many uh, customers are allowed in the shop, what the demand is, is all going to uh, really determine what that, the sort of long-term pro, uh, prospects are. Um, at the moment, all I can do is, is give you our firm commitment um, to, to the high streets and, and, and cities across Northern Ireland. Uh, yeah, and I think the, fur the furlough scheme um, was a bit of a godsend uh, in terms of you know, getting staff into that really, really quite quickly. Um, you know, we found that, you know, retail was the, within our membership, um, retailers were, it was almost 95% of retailers were availing of uh, the scheme and were putting a very high percentage of their staff into, into oh. furlough. So as, as Aidan has mentioned, having a, a an earlier date to reopen, um, uh, than perhaps we anticipated to be able to reopen safely has been a, a huge, huge help to those those retailers in terms of getting going again. Uh, and I would agree with Aidan that you know it will take a little bit of time to see what that actually means because you know whilst stores are going to be open, it is definitely with a very depressed um, footfall. Um, so it will take a little bit of time to see what what impact that has. Um, and but you know, one thing that I think we can be absolutely certain about was it had. Restrictions remained in place, and retailers had to remain closed, say throughout the summer. Then the chances of a, a, a quite a high number of job losses, I think, would have been very, very real. So I think getting open again safely quite quickly, with the tapering of the furlough scheme, gives a, a much greater chance than perhaps we would have thought had we been talking about this three, four weeks ago, uh, of retaining the maximum number of jobs. Okay, can I just ask one? Uh, Sam, it may have been yourself at the start of the presentation said that COVID-19 had accelerated the dynamics that were there before uh, and we all know the high street uh, was under severe pressure from different pressures. Um, uh, how do we, is it too early to start planning for that new future? Is, are we in survival mode or should we now start planning for the new future which is ahead of us? I think, sure, I think uh, actually it, was, it was Aidan said that, but I mean, I, I would have a view, and he can, Man, he can explain maybe a bit more. There's my, my, there's my, my, my upper band accent, but uh, copying, copying Aidan, talking to Aidan too much, I'm start, talk, talking to Aidan, Aidan too much, I'm starting to look like him, and I'm starting to sound like him now as well. Um, but I think, look, I, I think there is a mixture of, of, of both, um, I think, in, involved in all of this. You know, we need to absolutely, you know, survival and, and maintaining 
uh, as much of the retail footprint in our, our town centre, city centres, high streets is hugely important. But you know, I do think that's where we would in, encourage um, some of that kind of cross departmental thinking, because as I mentioned earlier, there is no sort of no, no department really takes ownership of, of of retail as a sector. It's a bit here, it's a bit there. There's an intervention from DFI required, or DFC, or DOF, or the Department for the Economy. Um, and I think that we need to use this crisis to um, develop a much better response in terms of the future for the sector. Uh, and that will be in that will be in city centres and high streets that are much more mixed than maybe traditionally where they were just purely retail. Um, it has to be about a, a hospitality, a leisure, a cultural, more residential as well. Um, and I think there's a lot of work across departments in conjunction with the industry that I think we can all collectively do um, to give the sector a better future than perhaps it, it, it has been looking at. But we, we need to use this crisis um, to accelerate that work, I think. Okay, thank uh, you. Yeah, uh, Simon, just to all the good points, um, I think... Belfast is slightly ahead in this um, in, in this race because they had uh, unfortunately had the bike buildings fire and there's a Belfast regeneration group that has been working um, since that, uh, which is almost two years ago, would you believe? Um, and it has um, it 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 has 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 looked at, at those from a particularly Belfast centric view. I think. Um, not, we, you know, these are conversations. Quite frankly, we should have been having about ten years ago. Um, but you know, better, better late than never. I think though we need to be aware that there are two conversations to be had. One is across Northern Ireland, what towns and cities, what support they will need. Second one is at a more local level, um, so that we make the best out of each and every town and city. For example, what was talked about about cafe culture earlier on. Um, if, even if you look at places like Newry, around the canal, around the town uh, hall, there, you know, that, if it was cleaned up, if it had that, you know, that, that cafe culture, it, it, you know, it just fits with it, with it perfectly. If you look at places like Bangor, with, you know, which has mm-hmm. huge potential because it's got a great leisure offer, great hospitality offer, and needs retail to rebuild in, in, in that area. So. There's, there's a wider conversation about what retail looks like in the uh, 21st century. And then there's the smaller conversation, but still just as important, about how do we do that and how do we manage it in a way that reflects not just the needs of the local area, uh, but the particular strengths of the local area. Okay, thank you. Just to conclude, perhaps there is lessons to be learned from how uh, government at all levels responded to the pre-mark fire and its impact on Belfast. Um, and that, that should they need, those lessons need to be shared right across the towns uh, uh, and cities across the north because I know obviously nobody was envious of the fire but certainly other areas were envious of how it was responded to. <laughs> on, on that point, Chair, sure, I think, yeah, look, there are, I mean, that was a, that was a huge crisis for the city at the time, and, and there was no a bit like this. There was no kind of manual um, yeah. to lift off the shelf and sort of work through in terms of response. But uh, the one, so it was, and I think I think it did. What, one of the huge benefits it had it was it brought a lot of partners together uh, within the city who continue to work together um, and had been working quite um, quite well on a range of different. And um, once you start that conversation, it leads into different spaces and. Um, we were looking at great ambitious plans for the city centre um, before all of this struck. I think one of the slight caveats around this is that a lot of the things that we looked at at that time was about how do we drive footfall back into the city centre. We wanted more people, um, and, and in fact, people responded incredibly well. The following Christmas, there was a huge increase in footfall year on year uh, afterwards. That's obviously going to be a little bit difficult, um, slightly different in the current situation where you know we aren't able to drive big numbers of people into city centres or town centres with events in the way that we might have uh, traditionally. Chair, sure, at, at this stage, I'm going to have to beg your indulgence. I called the, the Secretary of State on, on Brexit, um, which I said to you. Um, so I apologise. Thank you very much, Committee, for um, uh, having uh, allowing me to give evidence today. And if there's anything you would like to follow up with me on, um, you, you all have my email address, and I'm more than happy to do that. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Ian. Hi, Ian. Hi. Um, Simon, I think if you're okay to stay a wee minute, Claire Sugden has a question. Yeah, that's fine. I, I, can, I can talk all morning if you want, but I'm sure you don't want to hear me. Ty, are you still there? 
Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I think uh, Aidan was complaining about being the last to speak and everybody else has stole their ideas. Um, unfortunately for me, everybody has left the building. So, um, but uh, I think it's useful no, to kind of reiterate here. what... You, well, I know you're, you're always there, Gordon. Furniture. <laughs> 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 um, um, but I, I think it's important to reiterate some of the points that have already been made. Um, I suppose, Simon, starting off with you, you had talked about the indoor shopping centres, and I've had a number of constituents talk to me about that. And I think where we're at with uh, stores that have previously been allowed to open and those that will be opening from Friday, it doesn't make any sense at this stage, in my opinion, to, to um, continue to um, close those ones within the within the centres. I know there's a nervousness from the Chief Medical Officer around that, but um, I was speaking to the department yesterday and I get a sense that this will be discussed at Executive tomorrow and there might be some good news on that. I'm not sure. Um, I think it's also to pick up on the point around um, the hospitality, which goes hand in hand with the high street. Um, you know, I think this past 12 months has taught people how to shop online. So I think there is a reason um, as to why people will have to come into the town centre. And I think that has long been an issue, long before uh, the, the COVID pandemic, where we, we need to be finding other ways as to why people come onto the high street. And, and ultimately, and, and you've talked about this, I think, even in the last time you presented to us, around creating a social space. Um, but that very much includes the cafe culture again, which Aidan had talked about uh, previously. So, you know, we, we need to be able to support those organisations to coming back. And, you know, we haven't yet had an announcement in relation to uh, cafes and restaurants. And, you know, I think that maybe needs to, needs to be coming soon, albeit mindful of the, the wider uh, public health. Issue. Um, someone else had talked about uh, childcare. I'm getting a lot of uh, queries um, since the minister's announcement on Monday that retail will be able to open again. People are saying, "Well, what do we do for childcare?" Um, I know it's not necessarily the remit of this committee um, or the department, but I do think it goes hand in hand, and we need to have that joined up approach because it's all very well opening these shops but if, if the, the employees can't go back to work because they don't have childcare. And I had made inquiries with the Labour Relations Agency yesterday to, to understand that can these employees still um, satisfy, uh, satisfy the criteria for furlough? They believe so, but it will be at the discretion of the employer. Um, and I do think in the next number of weeks, months, um, business won't be, um, it won't immediately go back to where it was before until we can build confidence with consumers. Um, so maybe there is an opportunity to try and encourage employers to continue to make use of furlough where they can. Um, because it's at no cost to them, um, and you know, if anything, it's it's, it's uh, giving them a big saving on overheads in relation to HR. Um, and I suppose my last point, and a few people have talked about it as well, is that joined up approach. Um, and I would um, include councils within that. Um, I find find that. Um, you know, with a number of announcements um, and decisions which I believe would fall under the remit of local government, um, councils do seem nervous around bringing forward um, their own initiatives until they get that uh, confirmation from the executive. I understand that, but I don't know how we give uh, confidence back to councils for them to actually take the decisions which they are responsible for. I mean, to even give an example, and I think this does play into the whole town centre thing, public toilets, um, you know, yes, I know the, the health minister released a, a, a document last week which suggested that public uh, that toilets can be opened again. But um, where are people going to go to the toilet when they're in the high, you know in the town centres? You know, uh, stores that would previously have their own public toilets were going, are going to be reluctant to be able to provide that service. So again, is this a hindrance to bringing people in if they can't have the, the full access to, to being in the town centre as they would previously? So I do think that we need to give confidence to all stakeholders to to try and look at this in a joined up way to, to get us back to where we were and probably in a better position where we were before because I think a lot of these issues are not necessarily new but have been um, heightened by the COVID um, pandemic and um, there is a silver lining that we, you know, we see those issues and we now need to address them moving forward. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, sure. I think they're all, all very, very good, very well points. And, and I mean, I think, as I said before, retail is a sector that has been was challenged before this crisis. The, it has perhaps been exacerbated by the, particularly the, the, the move towards, say, online purchases. Um, huge increase, I think it was 30% increase um, nationally um, through revealing the awareness stats in terms of, of online sales. Um, and, and, you know, for quite some time, I think everybody has realised that 
you know the future of of retail in city centres, town centres uh, is not as predominant as it once was. It's much more about a, an overall experience, um, and the retailers who have done well and um, actually been doing incredibly well in some cases have been able to offer customers something a little bit more than just a basic transaction. Um, and I think those retailers will continue to do well after all of this, albeit they'll be impeded perhaps in, in the short term. Um, getting more people living in city centres and town centres is, is an important thing. I mean, Belfast in particular has, has a, an absence of a population in its uh, central core. Um, and I'm not saying that having more people living in the city centre would have uh, insulated traders of any kind from, from the problems of the last sort of 10, 12 weeks. Um, but Belfast has certainly been a lot quieter than a lot of provincial towns would have been because it doesn't have that um, city centre population. But I'm sure it's the case in, uh, right across the region that you know more people living in town centres um, is good for businesses located in, in, in city and town centres. Uh, on the childcare point, I mean, this is, again, it, it, it's not to sound um, churlish around getting an earlier date for reopening. Very grateful um, that we have got that. Uh, ideally, we would have been looking for a little bit more notice than what was received. Happy to take what is there, uh, don't get me wrong. But in seeking some of that notice, part of that was about recognising that uh, bringing staff back from furlough isn't just a simply a matter of saying, right, you're coming back tomorrow. Um, they will have care needs, child care needs that they will need to address uh, in fairly short order, and therefore notice would have would have been would have been something to be quite helpful. Uh, and, and similarly, you know, getting getting schools open again, getting some indication when uh, schools will be open on whatever basis it is, I think would be hugely helpful too. I think one one of the things that has perhaps come come through this conversation, and, um, maybe and I'm uncertainly that. That, that I think needs to be taken away is that, that joined up approach that, that Claire has spoken about, uh, Chair. And, and you know, I, I think that there are a lot of things that, that I have seen over the last number of weeks where if perhaps a little bit more power was located with local government, uh, we would have had a much quicker, maybe much more effective response on some issues. Um, you know, I have you mentioned the issue of, 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 of toilets, for example, and, and I think that general cleanliness, sanitization, provision of toilets is something that you know, councils should be stepping forward, and I know in Belfast they are stepping forward um, to provide. But I think there are some of those other issues around reimagining public space, um, seizing some of those opportunities. Um, we might have been able to do that much better if local authorities had had a little bit more power uh, to do that. Maybe I think your point is, isn't a bad point either around perhaps a lack of confidence in doing that. I think this has been, um, we've all been looking to central government uh, and to regional government for answers and the do's and don'ts around all of this crisis. So I can kind of understand why I see it with some of our members and I can understand why maybe councils are, are looking for that sort of guidance as well in, in the circumstances that they are. But, but certainly moving forward, if we want to really re revitalise high streets and city centres and town centres, I think we do need to examine you know, the powers that councils have to be able to do that in a, in a quick and effective way. Okay, thank you. Simon, Simon, thank you very much. And we will be taking up the, those points um, that have been highlighted in today's meeting and raising those with the, with the department and other um, ministers as well. So thank you very much for being with us, and I'm sure we'll have you back soon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you to everybody for uh, your indulgence. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Chair, if I can suggest, normally what we would do would be pair out the issues for individual ministers or whoever else. But the, the, the key message that's come out of that is coordination. So mm -hmm. if members are content, it might be better actually to let all of the, the participants who have a, a stake in, in all these yeah. issues to hear the whole picture at the same time. So first and deputy first, um, economy, infrastructure, communities, etc., justice, um, Solis Nilga and anyone else that yeah. ultimately has a responsibility there, because otherwise it's still part of the picture, rather mm -hmm. than getting the whole thing. Right. The members are content, that's that's the, the approach that we can take yeah. to write it, an all-encompassing piece to everybody that actually has a stake. Through the chair as well. Um, I mean, there, these are all very complex issues, and, and um, you know, there has to be some guidelines 
that are given that is given from from um, the leaders of this sector as well, but also from from central and local government. And I read in the Irish Times this morning that uh, Fulcher Ireland and some of the advisory bodies and some of the, the the departments are getting right down to the very specifics of um, the guidelines for the tourism sector within the Republic of Ireland. For, to the, the, the extent of even sharing plates should not be served, to the extent of vegetables must be served um, individually. You know, that's the type of detail we actually need um, for our sectors in order for them to prepare going forward. So it is, it's right down to the nitty gritty of the detail um, that is required. Now, um, I don't think we're at that space yet. You know, we're opening up, but we haven't got down to the nitty gritty. And you, you know, when we look at the the shops that are currently open, they're not in, you know, next door, next door, next door to one another. They're actually just shops, maybe in shopping, well, uh, you know, and uh, and um, shopping centres or shopping uh, areas, but they're not next door. If you have four or five shops Three. opening next door, where do you queue? What, you know, I'm in the queue for you know, the shop four doors away and somebody else behind me is in the shop. You know, it is really, really difficult and we haven't got down to the nitty gritty of all of that. So I really, you know, I, 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 I have absolutely sympathy for um, those in the, the representative bodies um, that have given us a briefing here today because it is a nightmare situation that they're going to have to deal with and they're dealing with it in two days' time mm -hmm. and they haven't been given the, 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 the nitty gritty of the deadlines or the details and, and, and really is, it's down to the very minute, you know, the, the, within Fulch Ireland, they've even, how, how you change the beds and what PP E equipment that yeah. you need for changing beds and how you pack them and how you take them up. That's the type of level of, of detail that we need to give the sectors, uh, and we're not there yet. Chair, I think that's that, that's sure. nice yes, go ahead, Claire. Um, no, I, I agree with Sinead entirely, and, and I think with every new uh, Northern Ireland executive announcement, it gives rise to further nuance and further complication. And you know, I just wonder is the executive running past? their announcements, you know, within the sector, within the stakeholders on the representative forums, to, you know, so that they can um, make suggestions around where that detail is required. To me, the most useful piece of information that the government put out in, in all of this was the Department of Health um, published a guidance paper which looked at every uh, area of this uh, approach and they, they provided clarity and detail, but I agree with um, uh, the Deputy Chair in that it, it just doesn't seem to be work, worked out. Um, you know, whilst these announcements are um, are very much welcome, it, you know, from a constituency uh, perspective, it, it really does give rise to more questions because it feels like it hasn't been thought through. And you know, I, I feel um, quite vulnerable in giving my own constituents advice because um, I'm not sure that if the advice I'm giving them is correct. And I'm trying to coordinate all the information that has been provided. And I, I do think the communications from the Northern Ireland Executive have been quite poor in that they have sought to put out announcements without actually realising who their audience is and knowing what their audience needs to hear and um, you know how it will help them move forward. And you know, I, I, I recognise this is a learning process, you know, despite however many years of devolution. Um, but I, I, I do think communications around this have been limited, and I would really like to see the executive look at ways of how they could strengthen that um, and I do intend to put that to them at, at the question time on Monday as well. Chair, can I just come in on that too? I think the, 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 the chaps earlier were quite reserved in their criticism for this because they wanted to highlight to focus on the positives but you know, Claire's right we have a situation where businesses in my constituency, depending on if they've got a, one business in one council area and one business in another, have been told two completely different things about their plan to reopen or what is or is not legal in terms of their, their opening strategy. Case in point, I made it earlier on about um, estate agents. One is being told they can operate and one is being told they can't. They're two miles apart, but they're in different council areas. One's been told they can show people around retail or rental properties. One's been told they can't. And one's been told that they can sell the house and one's been told they can't. And there is this constant overlap. I, it's not a perfect situation by any stretch, but we cannot have 11 different strategies from 11 different councils. And they're probably filling the, the void as we are as elected reps, answering the hundreds of questions we don't know answers to every time there's an announcement. But this is only going to get worse before it gets better because there's going to be more complex sectors reopening. When hospitality reopens, when health and beauty reopens, and we 
don't know how we're going to score the circle of two metre distance and it's only going to be harder for, for us. So they have to get that nipped now. I suppose that's something that we have been consistently raising with the department is that need for communication and uh, guidance and more sectoral guidance. Mm -hmm. um, so we can reiterate those points. Should the, we, I think that the committee had already... It is. It's something that goes into every letter and, and at, um, communicated as far as first and deputy first as well. Um, and, and again, it's been so heavily reflected today. It'll be. It'll certainly be very um, prominent in in this latest letter. Sure. Yes. I think this is where, uh, and this is another thing we've been raising constantly: uh, the role and the engagement with the engagement forum. Um, and I think it'd be useful if I think we may already ask, but I would like to hear directly from the engagement forum yeah. to, to their work mm -hmm. and to how they feel they're being responded to by the department um, or engaged with by the department. Yeah. We had something in the response from the minister last week in relation to the engagement forum that she was meant that we were having engagement with them. Um, so I, I think we're it's continuing to do that. Well, we we have. There has yeah. contacted um, from the Labour Relations Agency. In relation we have that, to that direct contact chair, um, um, and, asking and we are asking for for, for the readouts from various meetings and so on. Because I think the information we got before, and, and part of the thing is we we've had it sometimes from individual participants on the forum of, of what they've sent and what has come back. So it's it's kind of trying to get a um, collective. Yeah, yeah. So we, we've we've gone out for that. Um, I'll be talking to Tom on that one as well as as to just exactly how they format, what they do. Do they have a process? Because um, I think the conversation previously was very useful um, with with Tom and Marie, but I'm still not clear in my own mind how the process works. Um, and you know, is is it a regular thing? How the secretariat works and so on. So. I think probably it's one of those things that has appeared and it will evolve and, and establish those processes, but it would just be useful to know how it works. Chair, just on the, the issue of the local government involvement, we had Nilga on and we had Solis on, and why do we should try and get a quick check up from them. They did talk about going away and making a, developing a plan for reopening. I suppose, to be fair to them, things have moved so quickly now, they've yeah, right. probably caught up on them. But the other thing, we had that issue about who was responsible for enforcement and monitoring of premises. Now, I spoke to our council in Arjun North Down last week. They clearly now have additional powers. That is, the legislation has been amended. And they fully have responsibility for managing and enforcement of premises. There was a problem with enforcement who actually could close down a premise that shouldn't have been open. At one time it was left to the police, and the police were reluctant to do it for various reasons. But it clearly is now the responsibility of local councils. So that's positive, that's good. But not everybody knows that. The message is not out there, as John has said. And I think we, we need further guidance, and the public need it, and business needs it. And I think we need to try and highlight the whole issue and try and bring it forward. See you then, Chair. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have our. We next. do. We have we have um, John and um, Mark on the line. Okay, so we're moving on then to item number five on the agenda, um, and it's our briefing from the Construction Employers Federation, um, an update on the impact of COVID nineteen. So I'd like to welcome to our meeting this morning John Armstrong, who's the managing director of the Confederate or the Construction Employers Federation, and Mark Spence, who is the assistant director. Um, if you would like to make an opening statement, and then we'll open it up to members for questions. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, it's John Armstrong speaking here. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present this morning. What Mark and I will do is just take a very brief three or four minutes to do three things. First of all, just give you a little bit of background on the Federation and what we do. Secondly, cover our response to COVID and thirdly then address some of the key issues uh, that the construction industry is facing and has faced as a result of COVID in supporting the economy and getting ourselves back on the on track. And, and very finally, we have uh, a small number of suggestions to make that we think would help both the industry and the economy. So if you're happy on that basis, if I could just very briefly begin by giving you a little bit of background on the Federation. Um, we were established or uh, 
uh, yeah, established in 1945, which makes this our 75th year of operation. Uh, I think we're probably one of the oldest established representative bodies in Northern Ireland. We represent approximately 72% of the total construction output in Northern Ireland. And what separates us from other representative bodies across the British Isles is that we represent the totality of the construction contracting industry. What do I mean by that? Very simply, we represent house building, civil engineering, general contracting. And in house building, we represent both the social house builders and the private house builders. One of the other things, though, that we've done since 1945 and we're very proud of is that we have always provided benefits for those engaged in the industry. And if you want in the questioning, I can I can tell you a little bit more about that. The construction industry pre-COVID engaged approximately 65,000 people in Northern Ireland. Um, and I use the word engaged advisedly because about half of those were self-employed and half were fully employed. Um, another important feature of the industry is the multiplier effect we have on economic development. And very simply, for every one pound invested in construction activity, it generates a further three pounds in the broader economy. Moving on then briefly to our response to COVID. On the 23rd of March, you'll recall that the Prime Minister made his comments about the lockdown across the UK. Now, in those comments, he stated that the construction industry could and should remain open. In Northern Ireland, the Federation took a different view. And on the 24th of March, we advised our members to close. Now, what was interesting was by the end of that week, the industry and the Irish Republic and indeed in Scotland had followed suit with us. And our view was based primarily and fundamentally on the health of those engaged in the industry. What we subsequently did was we set up a COVID task group made up of both our members, of representatives from the supply industry and construction, health and safety specialists, and very importantly, the health and safety executive. And that task group undertook two things. First of all, to look at the health and safety aspects of a return to work. And secondly, then to engage with departments and with others about the commercial aspects of COVID. So we developed some very clear guidance for the industry, which we decided we would make publicly available. And you can refer to it on our website, should you choose. There is detailed guidance. And what we said to member companies was, take time to uh, consider these, make sure that you're able to implement these safe working practices and only when you are, then should you consider a return to work. And those safe working practices included issues around social distancing, the use of PPE, appropriate training and induction training for employees returning to sites. So that was our basic response. Uh, and then the second aspect of the COVID task group was to look at commercial aspects uh, and the commercial impact on the industry. And I'm going to ask Mark, my colleague, to come in there and, and carry on from there. Mark. Thank you, John. Um, yes, and John says we, we then engaged our members on commercial aspects, as you'll appreciate the impact of COVID on construction, no different to any other sector, uh, has been devastating. What was very important to our members was to understand post the shutdown how they uh, restructure uh, their contracts with clients uh, and start to deliver projects again, uh, but in a commercially viable sense. So we have been working very closely with CPD over the last number of weeks. Um, as you'll appreciate, about 60% of all construction work in Northern Ireland is public sector funded. So CPD, uh, representing the majority of public sector budget holders, have been engaged with us to determine how we capture the costs of COVID, both in the, in the immediate aftermath of the shutdown, but equally very importantly, how do we price tenders going forward with so many uncertainties uh, in the marketplace? And it's very important that the risk allocation is, is fair to contractors. Uh, the majority of contracts are fixed price contracts for a duration of time. And our feeling at the moment very strongly is that with so many uncertainties around uh, the virus and, and emerging scientific data, that it's probably unfair to ask contractors to put a fixed price uh, on a contract, and we would be very keen to work with public sector on an open book basis so that we share the risks in an open book way. 
This means that public sector is not overcharged for our estimation of risk if we think risk is very high, but equally that uh, contractors are not in a, what might be perceived as a, a race to the bottom to achieve low pricing to win the work, which is very much the imperative at the moment. Uh, the impact of, of the shutdown uh, was very devastating locally. Uh, we conducted member surveys which showed uh, about 66 or 67 percent of sites were shut down completely. Uh, a small number of sites were able to continue uh, with social distancing. But over a period of time, uh, the health and safety guidance which has emerged, which John has referred to, has enabled the vast majority of construction work to recommence, uh, albeit on a very cautious basis. We're certainly nowhere near uh, full capacity at this point, but the important membership me message back to us is that they're beginning to get to grips with the safety on sites. They're implementing very good procedures. That's been confirmed to us by HSE and by CPD on sites. They're impressed with what they see, and we, we commend our members for their cautious approach. One of the very important things to bear in mind for all budget holders is the impact on productivity on sites. So a given job will take longer on sites because you're trying to minimize the numbers of people on a site. The sequencing of work will change because different trades will take turns on site rather than working in parallel. Uh, and there's emerging data uh, from England where they have a, a, larger, a larger base and probably shut down to a lesser extent. That the, the very best productivity on sites would be around 80% compared to pre-COVID but it can go as low as, as the 30, 40, 50 percent, depending on the type of work. What this means for contractors is that the, the, the programs are very much extended and the costs rise. So we have immediate costs of PPE, uh, of social distancing, of wash stations, uh, even changes to transport and implementing perspex screens and vehicles. But it's actually the longer term costs in terms of productivity, the time it takes to complete the contract, which very much are uncertain at this time and why we would ask for, uh, if you like, the, the open book approach with the public sector. So that, that's a snapshot, if you like, of the main uncertainties uh, at the moment. I don't know if members may or may not have captured uh, also university reports from their economic policy centre on labour market impl implications that's been published yesterday and is getting some coverage today. And it reinforces really what we're saying is that the construction industry was massively affected by the shutdown. Uh, disproportionate uh, levels of furlough amongst construction companies. And, and I have to say furloughing has, and I think, I think Sam Hamilton said it has been a godsend to the industry and has saved jobs up to this point in time and was very welcome. Um, equally, I'm, I'm aware of the good work of your committee and the department uh, in terms of credit insurance uh, guarantee UK-wide, and I know that the Northern Ireland Executive represented the, the, the lobbying for that, and that's been a very useful relief in addition. So we're, we're, as an industry, we're very grateful for the support that's been available to date. And I suppose going forward, we're very anxious uh, to get the support of the entire executive to get the pipeline back up and running on a good commercial basis. We would have a great concern about apprenticeships in the industry, which is something we've long been promoting, but that we're finding very difficult to implement at the moment. We have ongoing concerns about Brexit, but that's not unique to construction. It's just in the background. But again, uncertainties are, are unsettling at any time. Um, but we also are aware that there's probably a shift in the market at the moment and, and your, your previous uh, attendees in terms of retail, uh, hospitality, and, and as add to that grade A office accommodation, those sectors which have been actually booming in Northern Ireland in recent years are obviously at the moment quite uncertain. So probably now more than ever, we are looking to the executive, to public sector, to continue to invest in Northern Ireland infrastructure. And that will be the, the main uh, construction uh, expenditure that we foresee in the future, and we're very keen to work with the executive to get the project on the ground uh, in the best way possible, as soon as possible, uh, to, to preserve jobs for the industry. So that's probably all, all John and I would say at this point, and I, I would be keen then to, to take some questions. Okay. Thank you very much for that. And, um, I, I think the point is well made around the, the importance of um, public sector funded construction and I know the Finance Minister has asked 
various departments to look at their, their capital projects with a view to, to moving those forward and obviously stimulating the, the local economy through through jobs um, that way. Um, obviously, yes, um, some of the, the issues you, you have highlighted are ones that have, have also been brought, brought to our attention um, from other sectors as well around the likes of apprenticeships, um, you know, real concern and obviously um, particularly in, in a, a sector like yours where you know there, there have been skill shortages as well um, over recent years so that's something that we are highlighting to, to the department um, and we'll hopefully be getting some briefing around quite soon. Um, a couple of specific questions um, I just wanted to pick up on with you. One that has been raised with us around the um, CSR training, um, that it's not currently possible to um, have those renewed um, because of the, the way the training is delivered. I was just wondering if you've had any communication with the department around that. Well, what we've done with the CSR scheme is that we've introduced a degree of flexibility. You're quite right, Chair, that the training provided by training providers, and there's a network of about 32 of those across Northern Ireland, is stopped at the moment. We've been trying to keep them closely in the picture with an aim of getting them up uh, and running again as quickly as possible. Um, and a number of them have taken very positive steps to try and ensure that they can do that in a safe way. But with regard to the renewal of the CSR cards, we've also introduced greater flexibility with regard to the, uh, the need for immediate renewal when the cards run out. Fundamentally, the importance of the CSR, it's called the Construction Skills Register, is to ensure that we have mobility of labour across the British Isles. So we must ensure that we maintain compatibility with our colleagues in the Irish Republic and their Safe Pass scheme, and with Great Britain and the CSCS scheme. But we're very conscious, to answer your question directly, that uh, the CSR training is not being provided at the moment. We hope to get that up and running as quickly as possible on a safe basis, uh, and we are keeping people informed as best we can. Okay, th thank you for that. That's useful to know. Um, I suppose a, a really practical thing that has been raised with myself and probably other members as well is the, the travelling to work um, for tradespeople. Um, and I was wondering, is the guidance that you have provided, does that cover um, specific guidance in relation to that? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mark, maybe you'll come in on that one, will you? Please. Uh, happy to, John. Yes, indeed. Uh, travel to work has been an issue. Um, the, the guidance which we have adopted is the UK-wide wide guidance from the Construction Leadership Council, which is constantly being updated and, as, as we've mentioned, has been endorsed by HSDNI. And it does provide guidance on travel to work because obviously there are risks of social distancing uh, in work vehicles. That, that guidance provides that you should minimise the, uh, the number of people in vehicles, but that if people do have to share vehicles to travel to work, ideally it should be the same people sharing the same vehicle at all times. So that will minimise the, the number of people to whom individuals are exposed. But we do know anecdotally from a lot of members that they, they've implemented some very good uh, mitigations for risk, including in, introducing screens within vehicles, uh, only having drivers in the front and the perspex screen to, to a second row of seats in the rear. Uh, and then there are also obviously hygiene sanitary measures in place to, to clean vehicles as well. So as far as possible, that, that risk is being managed and it's being managed within the, the UK-wide guidance, but I would just mention that we've uh, talked about apprenticeships up to this point. It is one of the, the, the risks uh, for apprenticeships at the moment in that uh, our employers are taking a view that they don't wish uh, to expose young apprentices necessarily to uh, transport. A lot of apprentices would have been reliant upon co-workers giving them lifts uh, to building sites because they're, they're not independently travelling and there may not be suitable transport links. So that is, that is one of the obstacles at the moment to young apprentices uh, being on site uh, and would require require some time, I think, to devise alternative strategies uh, for transport for them. But the, the short answer is yes, this is being dealt with and it's being dealt with within the UK-wide guidance, which HSE has uh, signed off locally. Um, thank you for that. I'm going to hand over to some other members. Um, Sinead? 
sorry, I missed a little bit of the last part, but I was going to bring up apprenticeships and, and, um, and I'm sure you've probably covered it. But in relation to the apprenticeship programme, uh, we had a report in our papers um, this week from MEGA and they have made a suggestion in relation to apprenticeships and they have uh, talked about uh, proposing that government provide financial assistance for retaining current apprenticeships uh, and recruit new ones for 12 months. Um, in the manufacturing and uh, engineering sector. Would that be something that the CEF would be um, pushing as well? We'd be very supportive of any move to, to uh, help apprenticeships. It's a, it's a section of, or it's a, an, a, uh, an issue for the industry and has been for many years. With the trade unions, we agree uh, the wages for those engaged in the industry. And in our last wage agreement with the unions, which was just pre-COVID, we made a point of emphasizing and, and strengthening the wages paid to uh, apprentices with an aim of encouraging more into the industry. Another thing just to point out is that the construction sector uh, pays a statutory levy to the Construction Industry Training Board. Now, we're probably unique in that. We're probably the last industry that pays a statutory levy. And we would welcome any support that could go to the training board to continue and to improve financial assistance for apprenticeships. The age profile of those engaged in the construction industry is quite high. And we're very conscious as an industry, we need to bring young people in to what is a very, despite public perceptions, a very exciting uh, career opportunity. And, and just to finish that off, one other aspect that the committee would probably be aware of is the UK government's apprenticeship levy, which was introduced some years ago now. Now, the construction industry in Northern Ireland not only pays the levy to the CITB, but where appropriate and where, the, where they're eligible for it, they have to pay this levy to the UK government. In Northern Ireland, we get absolutely nothing back to support apprenticeships or training in the broader sense from the apprenticeship levy. So I'm sorry to digress and skip around that topic a little bit, but I hope I answered your question in my initial remarks. Yes, thank you. And I think this is the time now that we address that apprenticeship levy. Um, there's no point in our, our businesses uh, giving money to the UK and not getting it back uh, right here on the ground where it is desperately needed. Absolutely. Okay. That's fine. I was going to ask about CSR training, but you've raised the issue, so that's grand. Um, Claire? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not sure if this has been covered yet, um, and it might not even be something you can answer me on. Um, I had considered yesterday um, in relation to uh, training for um, the likes of HGV drivers and being able to uh, conc or, uh, complete the medicals that's required for people to be licensed to be able to um, uh, drive HGVs and all of that across Northern Ireland. Are you, are you hearing any um, uh, challenges around that? Um, you know, is the, I suppose, is the construction employer pool limited because we aren't able to progress on those necessary uh, requirements around um, HGV driving and other types of training? Um, Claire, I, I, I think there's maybe two issues here. The basic training for HGV drivers, I haven't heard any issues on. But with regard to the appropriate cards, and this is going back to the CSR, the yeah, yeah. Card, they would probably fall into the same issues that we talked about more generically uh, with CSR mm -hmm. cards in that the training is at the moment basically shut down. Yeah. Now, as I said, the training providers are very keen to get back up. We're extremely keen to support them yeah. on that when they can do it in a safe way. And we're planning to perhaps pilot some with some of the training providers and, and is an aim to getting them back up and training as quickly as possible. I haven't heard of any issues in terms of bottlenecks with regard to supply for the industry of appropriately trained people. But I have no doubt that will come unless we get back to some normality quite quickly. Yeah, no, um, I, I think chatting with um, a constituent with the MMIR that, that, that provides that um, training, they are nervous around this. And I think it has long yeah. been a concern that we have a shortage of HGV drivers in Northern Ireland. And to me, it's, it's yeah. an opportunity to, to try and retrain and, and provide a skill. Um, yeah. So, you know, I'm concerned that, and I know this is this is probably an issue for the Department for Infrastructure, but again, I think it has that impact on the economy, particularly in relation to construction, that maybe people can't get moving because there's a, there seems to be a blockage in another uh, part of the system. But um, no, I appreciate that you recognise that, so thank you. Well, just, just important to, to differentiate between HGV drivers and the drivers of plant. 
And I suppose I'm talking primarily about plants, and by plants I mean diggers and excavators yeah. and, and so on and so forth. And there is a, a difference there, uh, but no, we're, okay. we're aware of the issues. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Claire. Gordon? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, gentlemen, for your presentation. John, in relation to government contracts, I understand that uh, a lot of tender documentation has been submitted for contracts and are sitting in government departments awaiting uh, decisions on contracts. Are you aware of that and the concerns that there are from your members about that? And back uh, yes, uh, uh, Gordon, yes, we are aware of that. Uh, and, uh, and Mark alluded to it earlier. And I'll, I'll ask him to come in because, as he said, he's been speaking to CPD or liaising with CPD closely and with other government departments. Mark, would you like to maybe come in on that one? Thank you. Thanks, John. Yes, we, we are aware, as John says, we're speaking with CPD. Uh, tenders which were uh, issued pre-COVID and priced on that basis and submitted pre-COVID, which have not yet been awarded, um, it has been agreed uh, with CPD that those tenders should go ahead to be awarded on the basis on which they were tendered in good faith, which ignores the COVID crisis. Um, at that point, then, the awarded contract uh, would then be reviewed in light of COVID on an open book basis to uh, uplift the costs for the necessary uh, implications of COVID. Um, the issue then really is, is that if a tender has been received and not yet opened, that's, that you would need the agreement of all the bidders that they would not subsequently challenge an award of contract on that basis. So if all, if all the bidders are willing to have the contract awarded on the basis on which it was priced in good faith, then it can be awarded. And then when it's been awarded, uh, there will be a, a review and uh, an uplift as necessary to cover any implications of COVID. And that, that seems to us a very fair basis. Um, it's certainly preferable to those tenders having to be re-tendered uh, and adding further delay to the delivery of infrastructure, uh, which, which serves neither the client, because the price will be the same, uh, nor the construction industry, because we are very keen to get the pipeline up and running again as quickly as possible. So have you had discussions with the, the Department of Finance on this issue? Well, CPD are, are uh, obviously under the remit of the Department of Finance. We yeah. know that that's being agreed at, at top level. Uh, we also have a meeting uh, with the Finance Minister uh, on the 17th, uh, and procurement will be at the top of that agenda as well. You have a meeting planned on that? Yeah. And in relation to just fixed, fixed cost contracts that, that were awarded and um, were not able to be met because of COVID, is there a, a process whereby contractors can then seek to uh, apply for additional costs in relation to that? Uh, there is again a process there. There, there are possible uh, differences of approach here. Uh, certain contracts awarded under what are called an NEC3 contract, which is the, the uh, preferred contract of CPD in Northern Ireland, normally have a clause within them that would take account of a situation such as COVID, and there would be a process within the contract then to agree any additional costs. Alongside that, uh, we have locally uh, procurement guidance note 0120, which was issued in March and updated in April, and reflects equally uh, the same guidance note across the whole of the UK from Cabinet Office and into each of the devolved regions. And that, that provides a, a separate mechanism uh, to cover the immediate impact of COVID uh, and is another avenue uh, that can be explored between clients and contractors so that there are a number of methods out there uh, which will allow those contracts to continue uh, and would be subject to agreement between client and contractor. Okay, thank you. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, in relation to the planning process uh, during the COVID period and even generally, how do you find the, the planning process since it went totally under, under responsibility of the local councils? And have you found some frustration in relation to, to that over the COVID period? Yes, uh, a, a, a very important point. Uh, the answer is we find some significant frustration and that's been uh, voiced to us by our members, particularly with regard to the lack of a functioning building control process. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Land registries seem to be completely out of action. 
and there yeah. were broader issues around planning. Now, to be fair, we've been liaising through NILGA with the local councils. And I think, as, as was mentioned in your previous uh, discussions with the retail sector, um, that situation is beginning to change. Some councils are, are, are beginning to reintroduce those services and get them back up and running again. But no members have expressed frustration at, uh, well, house builders in particular not being yeah. able to get completions because building control won't do the final inspections and, and issues like that. Yeah. And as you are aware, estate agents are keen to open, as we've talked about here on numerous occasions, especially, yeah. especially in relation to the new build. So market so uh, we will keep the pressure on we thank you for your contribution and keep up the good work thanks very much thanks chair john who died thank you uh john and mark for your presentation thus far um can i just ask in terms of uh, jobs uh have you any idea how many jobs have been lost in the construction sector as a result of covid19 and uh, sorry uh, it, 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 it's hard to say at this stage how many have been lost, but we are aware that uh, construction makes up about 7% of all employees in Northern Ireland. And of, the, of that, 12% of all people who have been furloughed are in the construction industry. So we've been disproportionately affected there, as Mark said. We, we estimate that there are some 27,000 people in the construction industry who have been furloughed or laid off. But in terms of job losses, it's probably a bit early to be definitive on that. But if I'm honest, there is a strong probability there will be significant job losses uh, the longer this goes on. I just yeah, the... I could maybe add to that a little. We did do a member survey uh, a few weeks ago. Now, this was at the point where the furlough uh, scheme had not yet been extended. So we were asking in the context of furlough ending in June, uh, what members felt would happen. And at that stage, 52% uh, of our membership foresaw redundancies of between 10 and 25% of their workforces. 42% saw no redundancies. And that, to be fair, I thought that was a relatively good figure, but uh, more than half of our membership do foresee redundancies at some level. Um, and again, I think that's a circular point back to the urgency of getting the pipeline up and running again before furlough starts again uh, to become an issue. Okay, uh, just and then it leads on to my second point and, and follows off Gordon's point, I suspect, in many ways. Uh, in terms of, of the pipeline opening up again, are you optimistic about the construction industry moving forward? Uh, and note your comments about rising costs uh, because of uh, labour, in the sense of the, the number of people you can have on a site, PP, etc., all those sorts of things. But are you optimistic? And added to that, and, and Gordon's point, um, I think you'll agree with this point. The public sector is far, far too slow in getting uh, projects on the ground. Um, as, as former minister, I, I announced projects five years ago, and they haven't started building yet. Um, with, with, uh, I can understand there's always nuances in every building project, but the system in my opinion, it is too slow to deliver. Uh, and just have, have you any thoughts on that? Yes, John, both of the two, to answer your first one, are we optimistic? Yes, we are optimistic. And I would take that back to the key role that the construction industry plays in the economy here. And do you remember I mentioned this economic multiplier? Um, and this is unique to the industry. Every pound that's invested in our industry creates three pounds in the broader economy. So we have a key role to play as the economy recovers from COVID. And in that sense, I'm very optimistic that the sooner we can get construction back up, the sooner it will start to play its part. And the sooner we can uh, ensure, as Mark said a minute ago, that those redundancies are minimized and that we start to create employment again. In terms of your comments about the public sector being too slow, um, this is one of the key issues we've been trying to address with other bodies over the last number of years. Uh, at the moment, the procurement process is uh, quite tortuous in that each of the appropriate government departments does its own procurement. And one of the things we've been calling for, and I think now is probably an opportune time to progress this, is for a centralised procurement body uh, with professional people who could deliver the projects that each of the departments design and specify, but deliver them more quickly and in a more, perhaps more professional way. 
the only point I would add to that, John, as well, is we very much welcomed at the start of this year the Finance Minister's statement that this would be the final single-year budget and that we would be moving to longer-term planning and three- to five-year budgets. And we do feel that's essential, and given the scale of some of public sector infrastructure investment and you have projects on roads and so on which span many years, it's very difficult to, to plan on single-year budgets. And there would be a tendency with all the budget holders uh, when they have a single year budget that, that there's rather shorter term uh, strategic investment, uh, which maybe doesn't serve serve either party well. So we, we, we look forward to the multi-year budgets after this year. Uh, we did welcome the, the, the small increases in capital budgets this year. And obviously the concern at the moment is that those budgets may not even be able to be spent in the time remaining to us post-COVID. Yeah, just just a comment really. I have no firm views in relation as to a single delivery mechanism for public uh, construction. Um, it's something I'd like to think about a wee bit longer. I know it has been around for a while, and even during my time. One of the issues I find, uh, from my experience, is this, uh, and it's a danger moving forward, that our, our civil servants are so risk adverse because we as politicians have put so many layers of accountancy and accountability on top of them, some for very valid reasons, others not for such valid reasons, that you could spend um, over a year on one piece of documentation in relation to a building programme being delivered by the consultancy, which you paid a considerable amount of money to hire. That then goes into a department. The department then marks that consultant's homework. Then someone else marks that homework. And it's a, it could be six months, nine months, a year before that comes back around again. So it's regardless of whoever is delivering the programme of work, unless we have the, the right level of accountability in place, then we're just going to go back to square one again. Uh, mm. So that, that's as much a comment as any. I'm not expecting you to respond, or maybe you wish to. Well, no, I, I would agree with you on that. I think there's a there's a fine balance to be got between the process and the output or the outcome, and I think uh, perhaps that that has uh, has swung a little bit too far towards process rather than outcome, and it's maybe an opportunity to to redress that at this stage a little bit. Um, and that's all I would say on that. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. I just I want to pick up on one final point from myself. Um, obviously, over the course of this, we've been contacted by a lot of um, what are described as sole traders, but some of those will have been trades people. Um, and I was wondering if you have any particular views around the impact that the lack of support has had on, on some of those. Mark, do you want to comment? Yes, I mean, I think we picked it up in our earlier comments that in construction, I think there's a perception that we have a, a, a large number of very big construction companies in Northern Ireland. In truth, we don't. Um, the likelihood is that you drive past the building site, at least half of the people that you observe there are self-employed tradespeople. Um, and we are very conscious that with them being in the supply chain, for all uh, larger schemes, and they've been disproportionately affected. They're very, very keen to get back to work. It's essential to get back to work. Um, although provision has been made for the self-employed, it was it was some time coming. It was behind the furlough uh, support, and we know it's been very, very uh, impactful on a large part of the the construction family. Um, so we, no, we're, we're very mindful of that and we hope and we believe there's been very good practice amongst our members in looking after their supply chains, uh, certainly in terms of payments and so on. And we hope that continues, but again, it's back to the pipeline issue. The sooner everybody can get back to sites and be productive and, and can engage again, these, these self-employed trades people who are absolutely the, the, the bedrock of everything that's happened in the local industry. Oh, I appreciate that, thank you. Um, well, look, thank you very much for joining us this morning. It has been really useful to, to, to us to hear the feedback from the sector. Um, and, you know, um, I'm sure we'll be hearing more from you in the, the time ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're moving on. Okay, so we're moving on then to item number six, which is matters arising. Um, there is a letter from the Minister at page 17 of your packs 
outlining a proposal for UK-wide regulation that will maintain the North alignment with EU pressure equipment directive. Um, are members content to note that? Great. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, I didn't, yeah, there's been a duplication yeah, there. Chair, the, the system occasionally throws up an exciting <laughs> new quirk, and what it has done is it bounced 6.1 into 6.2 as well. So now everything subsequently is the wrong number, but I think there's clarification for that in the in the book as we go along. So everything should have been a number before, but there's there's a duplication in those first two. Okay, so the next one then is six point three, which is a copy of correspondence from the Minister of State for Business, Energy and Clean uh, Clean Growth at page nineteen on the future relationship with the EU on energy. And the Minister recognises it's important to take into account the views of the devolved administrations in relation to this matter. Um, obviously, we had the letter from um, the Minister and I think the dear Minister that went to yeah. Quasi Quartang um, a few weeks ago. So, are members content to note that? Um, obviously, there are um, particular issues around um, the negotiations that will impact on. Um, the, the carbon pricing and sure, maybe some some things just worth highlighting. The um the, 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 didn't realise until I read this. Um, single electricity market doesn't actually cover the interconnectors, um. So that will be subject to different arrangements, um. But the, the hopeful thing here is that because the the single electricity market has been so long established and is so well received by by both um UK government and the EU, that. Yeah. They will go all out and trying to make that continue to work. Um, the, the the other bit, the paragraph down, is being represented and cooperating with EU schemes. Um, the EU doesn't consider that a done deal in their legal text um, around the current negotiation plus the protocol. So that again is something that's going to have to be negotiated further on. Um, also, just. Um, Further highlighting the uh, emissions trading, the desire by the executive to have UK and EU uh, emissions trading schemes to be um, running in alignment, so that it just makes it a lot easier here if we're trying to manage that. Because you know, again, that will fall into the protocol, and there'll be implications from that. And um, the unfettered access idea, again, the, the letter reflects that. That will be a key focus of UK EU negotiations, um, trying to ensure the unfettered access, um, maintaining that with the, the the spirit and text of the protocol and so on as well. So there's still a lot of issues to resolve on this. Okay. Um, Just through the chair there as well as from a cross border perspective. It's, it just makes sense that you have um, an agreement on air quality, on coal, standards and, and, and just carbon taxes, it's really, really important. Um, there's no differentiation really from what we have in, in Derry than that what should be in Donegal as well. I think the recognition of the success of the, the single electricity yeah. market and then the wider um, energy market across the island, um, I think both, both sides of negotiations are recognising that there doesn't seem to be any particular um, axe to grind there. Um, I think everyone sees cross-border energy as, as the, 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 the established way and the best way forward. Okay. So um, the, the letter's tone is fairly positive in that respect. Okay, okay well, something we, we will yeah, continue yeah. To, to keep an eye on. Um, Okay, so moving on then to item number um, 6.4, which is a departmental response um, on page 23 of your packs, which is quite out of date. Yeah, it's a um, couple of months now. Since we, we sent it in um, back in March um, in relation to the job retention scheme. Mm -hmm. So, just for note. Yeah, John, go ahead. Uh, it's disappointing the length of time it's taken to produce that response, but anyway, uh, it, it's come to highlight again, I'd have raised this in the Assembly yesterday around uh, the loss of 500 jobs at Euro, Thompson's Euro seating in Portadown. And one of the factors which the unions have concentrated on there is that today is the end of the applications for uh, the furlough scheme. Uh, those jobs could be saved, or some of them could be saved, 
if the, the job retention scheme was extended for a number of weeks or a number of months because they have a contract to finish and they need to finish the contract, one, because it's a contract, but also they want to keep their good name in, in the euro uh, seat industry, or the euro industry. So if that scheme was extended, there is a possibility where we could save some of those 500 jobs. So it could be right back to the department and just encourage them to continue to liaise with uh, Westminster in regards to that matter. Yep. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so moving on then to um, 6.5, there is a cor correspondence from the Committee of for Finance on page 25 in relation to the changes in the hardship fund. Um, if members are content, the, the clerk will um, respond indicating that we've raised this. Yeah, Chair, um, I'd already mentioned this now to the, the finance clerk, just to clarify that they, the committee dealt with this directly face to face with the Minister. Um, brought up by Mr Stewart, I think he probably remembers the occasion. It's hand-sorted. Uh, the Minister did apologise for the confusion and explained the background to it. So what we do is we lift the hand record and we send that to the Finance Committee. Yeah. Chair, just through you on, on the Hardship Fund, if you don't mind. Um, it seems that the uh, refusals are starting to go out. I haven't spoken to many people who have received confirmation that they're getting it, but I have had one last night and another one just in, during this meeting to say they've been turned down. Could we write urgently to get exact clarity on these qualifying factors? Because they're quite vague, which seems to be broad enough to qualify. But I've had a company there that has more than nine people on the books, but has not paid them this year. And then I've been told they're not eligible because their employee numbers go over 10, but they actually didn't pay anybody. And say you bring on someone to deliver your newspapers, you might have 15 in one year. You know, just because mm -hmm. the nature that they might show up once, you just never bother taking them off the books. But they're not an employee, they're just sitting there and they're now getting an email this morning to say, sorry, you haven't met the criteria. Chair, I suppose this goes back to what you mentioned at the outset, that the figures we've seen in the Belfast Telegraph today, mm -hmm. uh, considering the scheme closes on Friday, suggest that it's no, got nowhere near the 8,000 uptake that there should have been, that, that was um, mm -hmm. originally budgeted for and that the criteria were set for. I think at some one stage, people from the department were talking nearly 10,000 people potentially. So obviously someone has not got the numbers anywhere near right. And a lot more people, this could have been broadened out a lot earlier to help those in genuine hardship. And I'm aware of a social enterprise today that has spent years building up its company to support vulnerable people in the community in my constituency and they're about to go out of business. They won't last this week. And that is happening on a daily basis and they're still not getting access to this. And while we're all in grants, I'm still getting people who cannot get an answer on their £10,000 original grant. And when they email someone, they get an automated response and it just says, um, grant assessor. No name applied to it. You can't phone anybody. You can't make your case. It's emails back and forward. We need, so now that we're apparently 99% have been sorted, yeah, we need yeah. somebody to get these real difficult ones over the line. Um, Peter, when I spoke to the Permanent Secretary a couple of weeks ago, he indicated there was an email to be made available. That hasn't come to us yeah, as far so as I know. Can we that one up as well, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and obviously, yeah, we, we, at the start of the meeting, we did highlight as well about the, the hardship fund and obviously those who need to be included in it, and particularly if the uptake is lower than mm -hmm. what was anticipated, that that needs to be revised and revised urgently because ASAP, yeah. people have been waiting far too long for the assistance. Chair, it would be interesting to see um, in terms of the, the applications that have been had so far, how much of the fund that will actually take up. And if there's a considerable amount of money there that's obviously left, then it would make sense to very rapidly widen out the criteria and keep the thing open. It had been raised with me as well that there was nearly a two-tier thing to it, that if you had a premises or you, you didn't, in terms of the hardship fund, and it would just be useful to get a bit of clarity around that yeah. as well. Um, Chair, it might be useful if members use their, their good offices to see if that can make its way to the executive in the next couple of days. <coughs> I it would be just really interesting to know, sorry, through the chair, how much money is left, how much money is in that envelope that the minister was talking about, uh, because if we can reprofile it, brilliant. Uh, obviously, as well, there is the ad hoc committee tomorrow, so we will have the opportunity to put some members questions. did ask for lists of issues, and that that will be one of the issues. Yeah. Um, uh, and there's obviously June monitoring coming up as well, mm -hmm. which allows for reprofiling of budgets um, and redirects if. There's money available. I think that's something that we, we have 
certainly now that the, the there's there's funds and there's grants and so on available, a lot of the uh, queries that have been coming in that don't fit into any of those, that's generally the response we've been looking at is we'll see what June monitoring brings mm -hmm. um, and some of the hope to widen out the hardship fund have been predicated on some yeah. new funding from um, the monitoring round. So yeah, there's a lot to be played for in the next couple of weeks in terms of whether that fund can be grown and widened. Yeah, but as, as John has pointed out, some of these people have been waiting a really long time for any support and you know, they're at the point now where it's critical. So. Just on the, the point of contact, were we not to put them through to the private office? Yes, yes. Chair, the, the, the initially it was done. And then there was going to be a, a gen more general email for members um, that we haven't had yet, so I'll, I'll follow up on that. Um, and it was specifically in relation to the grant issues? Yeah, yeah. The other point, Chair, just was about, we, think we talked about maybe what residue would be from the other previous two grants, the 10 and the 25. What? In terms of the uptake, maybe yes. we can get a breakdown, because Good, I did see that, that in fine, the right? paper yeah. that you shared from yeah. um, Tourism Alliance, there was a breakdown of the 25k, but there doesn't seem to have been one for the, the 10k, yeah. so if we could get those um, numbers from the department as well. Okay, members, yep. happy to move on? Sure, on, thanks. Um, then, yeah, so at page 26 of your pack, there is a briefing paper from, from MEGA, the Manufacturing and Engineering Growth Advancement Network, um, which is based in Mid Ulster. Um, there is some really useful information contained in the briefing um, and some suggestions around the, the need for short-term intervention from the department. Um, I, met, I met with them um, a couple of weeks ago um, and obviously these are um, industry partners who are really keen to, to keep apprentices on um, but are very concerned about the ability of employers to do that over the, the next number of months um, and I think if we could pass this on to the department, highlight the urgency around this. Obviously we've had the briefings this week from the FE colleges, Chair, we've had some was, other information. Chair, from I was going to try and draw that in because um, I knew this would be coming up today so I held off on issuing the letter from yesterday and if members are content, this provides one of what could be potentially many plans yeah. Yeah, yeah. to to you know resolve the issues that have, have arisen around um, apprenticeship. So if members are content, we can fold that into the letter that will go to yeah. the department. Sure, I think, yeah, that's beautiful what you're suggesting. I think this group um, it has done some good work. Uh, the point is that about 70% of manufacturing is outside of Belfast, and a lot of it is in this mid Ulster area. And has been developed and over over a number of years, and there's a lot of good manufacturing. It's somewhere we should go, being, all being well as a committee, when we get ourselves back to normal, whenever that will be, and and you know and go and visit some of these places. But you know they, they've got the the support of Invest NI and their local council, so that's very positive. And um, you know I think we should, as a committee, do what we can to to work with them and and try and get some commitment from our Department of Economy towards supporting the, the thing about apprentices. It's vital, it's, you know, as every member has mentioned here, I think we, we're so keen to see it happening. I think we should be supportive of people like this that are really manufacturing and doing good work and have opportunities for apprentices that we all want to see. Yeah. And who are keen to work with us. Yes. Um, John O'Dowd. Yeah, it's just that point I want to make. Uh, it's a recognition of companies coming forward or organisations coming forward with potential solutions rather than a list of problems. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I recognise some of these organisations' names from different, or these companies' names from different uh, initiatives they've conducted down through the years and fair play them. It's a credit them. Through the chair. Um, also, I think we need to discuss the apprenticeship le levy. We need to uh, get mm -hmm. the minister to, you know, speak to our counterparts with, within Whitehall and make sure that um, the, the apprenticeship levy is put back on the agenda because it is hurting a lot of businesses here. They're paying out and they're getting nothing back. It's, it's been a running issue it's a running very sin, ever since the, the, the committee. Um, mm -hmm. up here. And I know it has, it has not worked smoothly in GB either. Um, it, it's not particularly well received there. And obviously here, there's no um, benefit at all plus 
because of their size and the fact that um, they fall into the scheme, government departments here, executive departments have to pay. And that's not coming back and it's not being utilised locally, so that there's huge issues there. We could be using um, that money to, to support young people into jobs uh, instead of just, it's an added tax to, to, for businesses with, with no benefit. Chair, as, as was flagged up by CEF, they already pay mm -hmm. um, our own um, CITB mm -hmm. yeah. levy for this, uh, which was, I can recall at the time, all raised with um, UK government and didn't get anywhere, but I know ministers are, have always been um, active in trying to, trying to sort this out. So again, we fold the issue in. We've already um, flagged it up in a couple of the previous issues, but it, it falls very naturally within what we've heard over the last couple of days around apprenticeships and so on. Okay, um, moving on then, 6.7, a page three of your table paper is that um, report from the Tourism Alliance in response to our request on tourism businesses who've been unable to avail of um, support. So are our members content to, to forward that to the department? Chair, can I just um, take the opportunity to put on record our thanks um, to Joanne Stewart and the, the Tourism Alliance who have constantly been updating the committee. We have had updates um, constantly from them that are really good at bringing together information Great summaries. and it's been really really a help, very helpful resource so I just mm -hmm. want to put that on record. I think they've been very proactive as well too in the yeah. media and, and on the credit. I think the other issue that is important is the, the rates uh, rebate or whatever for a year, the rates clearance for a year which we're still waiting finalisation on. I doubt put a, a question into the Minister about that. The specific businesses that will be eligible for it and Chair, we, we've we've written to um, we, we we innovatively wrote to the finance committee to ask them to actively pursue that. Good, Minister. So hopefully um, that's been an issue they have focused on because members will recall that the correspondence that they wanted to act, um, you know, as kind of a, a, a group um, with the economy committee. So yeah. we've asked them to take that one forward. We need to keep the pressure on the finance minister, I reckon. <laughs> Are we all agreed? Aye. <laughs> Under pressure. Well, that's for it. Good stuff. Like, uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, just to highlight to members, there's some number and issues yes. with the, the, uh, the numbers in the pack and what they should be. So yeah. we're at 6.8 now, but it's 6.7 in your pack. Right. So it's um, a paper from the London Dairy Chamber of Commerce at page 21 of your table papers, um, providing some information on business support. Uh, Peter, just to pick up on some of the things that they had mentioned, and there's a case study in there. Yes. Um, and I think, could we seek some clarity around that case study, please, yeah. uh, from the department? Um, can we pick that one up? Because it seems like they should be eligible for the grant and haven't been um, awarded it. Chair, this provides a useful example just for members to see if the format of the information we've been collecting. We've, we've been doing a number of um, various surveys and this, this was one we looked at for who was falling through the gaps. So we've gone out to all the chambers, all of our um, business organisations, stakeholders and pretty much everyone we've been in contact with. But this gives a good idea for members to see just the, the kind of information we've been gathering. So these are all going to the department. And I'm sure Sinead and, and Gary, we still on the line, will be familiar with Foil International. Yeah. Um, and the, the, what they do provide, and it's very much a tourism-based um, business. Are you looking into Yeah, through, through the chair. I've already sent this to, to the department, and unfortunately, it didn't get the reply that I wanted. But I think that our focus, is, or the focus sometimes is too narrow. They're, they're looking at it in the round instead of actually delving into, for example, Foil Language School, bring hundreds of people to Derry. It's like educational tourism. Uh, and it's just that our definition of what we see as tourism is too narrow. And therefore, organisations that are legitimately, uh, you know, they were stopped overnight. Uh, and all of the students had to return to their, their home places and, uh, and they've fallen out of the system. So um, I really do support um, Paul and his team who do a wonderful job year in, year out, and they're in desperation now. Chair, it's very reflective of actually the examples we've been getting through where 
members will recall we talked about the idea of the vertical supply chain so mm-hmm. it's not just that this is the business it is it's 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 who it buys from it's the output from as you say if you bring in lots of people they are spending there's a multiplier effect there mm-hmm. and i think that's apparent from the information we've got that there there hasn't been a wider view it's been yeah. very focused on the, the 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 contained business itself what does that contained business mean how many people is employment it's not the the overall picture but from the figures that we and i'm not sure if those are finalized figures that were in the the nida paper um it seems that the 25k grant scheme was under um subscribed yeah. as well so you know, if that's the case, then we need to be looking Yeah, because we've, we've got, that's one of our, our actions coming out, is to find out just exactly what the updates yeah. were and what the numbers mm. were, because yeah. if there's any money left, then now's the time to widen out those criteria. And mm-hmm. that was one of the, the reasons behind this exercise, was to flag up, here are people, here, here is a list of businesses mm-hmm. and sectors that are not falling into the schemes, or not falling into the grants that needs help. And I know... Um, the finance committee has done exactly the same job, so it's it's all the information is there. It's an evidence based study, yeah. and we will forward all of that. We'll go on to the department. Okay, Chair, can I just re- read out something to you? while we're on the grants again? Let me just give you an example. This is one of 40 cases in my books in a minute from people who can't get their grants. So, this family the husband owns a chip shop, and the wife owns a beauty salon and a, a sunbed shop. All three premises qualify for small business rate relief, and all three are entitled to £10,000. I've looked at the case, there's no doubt. After weeks and weeks of back and forward to an unnamed person, hello, Mrs. Please be advised, the rate pairs. Uh, who occupy these three premises are not entitled to small business rate relief and therefore you're not eligible for your 10 grand. So if you if you occupy three or more premises, you don't get small business rate relief. End of story. Yet their, their bill says they have small business rate relief and they qualify for all the features and, what, nine weeks down the line they're still being told they don't meet the criteria and they haven't had a penny. And that's from an unnamed person from the small business grants team. How is that possible? We did get a response on an arbitration scheme or a redress. We still Mm -hmm. aren't clear on that. Again, I flag that up in the grants letter. Um, There there are gaps there. It's 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 not. There isn't. Sorry, chair. There isn't a appeal system being set up. Is that that's is that in place yet? No, Mm -hmm. I don't believe it's finalised, but it's well underway in progress, and it, it has been set up. It's not even factually correct, though. It says, please be advised that rate payers who occupy three or more premises are not entitled to small business rate relief. Small business rate relief uh-huh. is an assessment process on each building that is deducted on bills. So that's not even a factual statement that's going out from the department or from that rates, whoever that is. That was part of the reason for using the existing correct. systems. And, yeah. and mm-hmm. There wasn't any ambiguity. That information's there. It's on record. Mm-hmm. That, that'll be clear. I don't understand where the disjoint has yeah. come in. Yeah. Doesn't make sense. Uh, Okay. Um, moving on then to, to 6.9, there is correspondence to page 23 of your table papers from NUS USA regarding a response to um, Ian Paisley MP and um, if members have a, have a look at it there that you will all be familiar with the discussion around the student hardship funding um, and the additional money that was made available. Peter, can we please try and clarify this with the department because the 1.4 million that was made available from the last COVID allocation um, was additional money as far as I understood, but I believe the last time the minister was in, they were still looking at whether or not the department was going to additionally top that up with match funding from within their own budget. Um, And it may be part of the June monitoring. So um, it it probably will be chair in terms of Moving it from another budget, you know, if there if there are lines they can move it from. So hopefully we we get carried on it. But it is, I think it's worth yeah, sending, sending the, the, the letter there already. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving on then to correspondence um, item number seven. Um, there is correspondence page thirty seven um, of your pack from Bliss and Tiny Life to organisations that are charities for babies that are born premature or vulnerable. They highlight that the current parental leave policy doesn't provide additional support for parents if their baby is born with um, needing specialist care. So COVID-19 is exacerbating the problem with mothers and fathers returning to work sooner. Um, So 
Peter, I wonder if it's something that we can explore in a wee bit more detail, especially with the, um, the, the, the consultation going on, but that's, that's a different issue. But Chair, I was just thinking exactly the same thing. It's a different issue, but you would have thought there was room to run parallel consultation there, because in terms of legislation, you, you might well want to legislate all these at the same time. So, yeah, we, we'll explore that and see whether there's potential to do that. Um, so right, have we sent this to the department? Yes, we're going to do that and seek, seek Sorry, a view yeah, on whether it can be yeah. rolled in with other um, yeah, schemes. policies that are going on at the minute. Yeah, right, thank you. Okay, 7.2 then, there is correspondence from, from Rani um, at page 42 concerning DFE's RHA tariff consultation and the proposed scheme um, closure. So, um, members content to note this um, as the, it was sent to the department for a, a response. Mm -hmm. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. 7.3 then, um, there is a twelfth report of the examiner statutory rules um, at page 37 of your table papers. The examiner is content with the department's reasons for the breach of the 21-day rule for the SR 2020-68, the Working Time Coronavirus Amendment Regulations NI 2020, and SR 2020-70, the statutory paternity pay, statutory adoption pay, and statutory shared parental pay, normal weekly earnings, etc. Coronavirus Amendment Regulations NI 2020. Um, are members content to note those? Yeah. Great. Okay, so item number eight on our agenda is the forward work program. Um, it's at page 151 of your pack, and let me just go back to my pack. Um, so obviously members will have have we'll be exhausted. That we have had um, a large number of briefings. Um, we we have a lot of briefings that we want to get in the next few weeks. Um, and I guess we just wanted to get some members' views around how, how we are doing all of this. I mean, this was a, a particularly heavy week where we had three meetings um, this week. But we have planned two meetings a week for the next couple of weeks. Next week again, we're going to have three because we're going to have an One of which is informal, Chair, yes. And we're going to try and starleaf it, which means technically nobody needs to be here. Mm -hmm. Although... I might just be here just in case we'll have to revert to the phone. You can't dial in on Starleaf, but it just hasn't done a lot of piloting yet. So there's a couple of options. We can continue um, while we are able to do the Monday meeting um, if there's no um, sittings on a Monday. And John, maybe you can advise us of when we're expecting sittings on a Monday. To um, there's none for the next two weeks. None for the next two weeks. Probably okay then. Okay. Um, or we could look at doing three briefings in a one meeting again and starting the meeting earlier, but that's kind of a heavy session then, so it's, yeah, it's up to the, members the, what they feel might be best. Chair, in the good old days, when I started 12 years ago, we used to do one briefing a week because that allowed, you know, you had full time for everything mm -hmm. around that discussion and, and all that kind of thing. And we'd crept up to three purely because since the departmental mergers or, or the, the, the restructuring of the departments, um, pretty much every committee now has a really massive remit. Um, so trying to cover it become really complicated and difficult. But I think members will, will agree that three in one session is heavy. massively... Too much. It's taxing in terms of trying to keep hold of the information. And in this particular crisis time, when... Um, there wasn't that ability to schedule forward, if you like. Things were so immediate. Mm -hmm. uh, we did. We have fallen back on the the additional meetings. Um, touching wood. Um, I'm sort of seeing a beginning of an end to that because we we have. I think the committee deserves, um, you know, thanks for for their forbearance, if nothing else. But the amount of organisations that have been given a platform by the committee, um, who simply haven't had a voice elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, has has added to that that need for meetings, but I do think it's been incredibly worthwhile. But going forward, we are focused now is to try and and keep things as as manageable as possible. We we do have this run on until uh, the beginning of July, where we have two week, and then we, we we drop down. And obviously, going forward, once we have had time to get a 
strategy discussion in. Mm-hmm. We, we never really got a chance to do that. Um, all sorts of stuff happened in the meantime, but once we, we get a, a time for a strategy um, discussion, we can start looking at you know ways of yeah. refining what the, the committee goes and, and what can be done in a written way and what, what actually needs to be focused on in terms of briefings. Okay. So our members content for the next three weeks? You, maybe the other one I should flag up is we do go to the 15th of July because that was the first time we could see, we could get a briefing on Project Stratum because they're currently in the tendering process. So tendering should be finalised, the process of, of examining tender should be pro- finalised by the 10th of July. So the 15th, whether through the 15th is the first time we could get them in, but we haven't scheduled beyond that. If members are content to go to the 15th, yeah. um, then we will work with correspondence or informal video meeting beyond that and only really meet where we have legislation. I do anticipate um, in the region of 20 uh, pieces of secondary legislation coming across the summer um, related to EU exit. Um, when you say across the summer, Peter, what, do we have an, a well, timeline for that yet? Really? Um, we're, we're talking June, July, August, we think. Now, the beauty of secondary legislation, as members know, is that it's countdown for re- negative resolution is dependent on the number of plenary sessions, counting down the number of plenary sessions. So by and large, we can cluster those and just have a dedicated session when we have enough clustered. Um, I think the intention is, and I know it's something that's been discussed by the business committee, and I think the executive have discussed as well, in terms of trying to clear August from executive business, there'll be executive business continues during July, and that's where the legislation will come from. But because of the, the, the number of plenaries, the 10 plenary countdown on that, we don't necessarily need to deal with it as it comes. We can cluster and, and kind of create a meeting around that if members are... Yeah. Kind of, but it will just be seeing how rapidly it comes. I have a horrible feeling it'll all come in September. Yeah, it's, uh, the Family Business Committee yesterday agreed that August would be the recess period. That's what we were hoping for, so we will, we will keep that clear. Um, Chair, a couple of members had mentioned... Um, beginning outside visits and meetings again. Yeah. Um, that kind of would be the intention of the strategy session, probably start of September when we really know what's going on. Um, we've abandoned a number of, of visits that we'd intended to make, but I, I think that probably the, the one that's been abandoned most is our trip to the Northwest, um, who have, have repeatedly reorganized for us and then been told no for various things have happened and we, we've not been able to get there. So what we would intend to do for the strategy session would be go up, do some visits, have the strategy session, um, do meetings with stakeholders and then have a meeting the following day. Um, Again, with some more touring. We would do it preferably, depending on the um, dates for the start of the next session. We would do it the week before plenary start in Mm -hmm. September. So it means that members aren't aren't, um, having to sort of be caught up with a plenary and then trying to get to somewhere and so on. So it would just give us that sort of clear day and a half or so. So if members are content, we start planning on that. We have a number of other visits, um, including our shared visit with other committees to um, Larnport that we never managed to do. Uh, also, we'd have committed to seeing a social enterprise there as well. So we start looking at possibly reshedding. Again, that's all dependent on, on what we're able to do when the time comes. Okay. So, After a lot of Well, <coughs> funny you say that. We do I have talking. we have the, the, the genesis of a Loch Ness experience. Oh, and, I um, but <laughs> I will say no thing. more on that. And of course, <coughs> we, could, we couldn't possibly uh, not go to Bangor. That would be great. Uh-huh. So for the next three weeks, we're going to meet this week, one on the Monday that will be a single item, and then our Wednesday meeting is normal. Apart from the, the informal Thursday next week with EU, uh, with Paul Grocott and the Prime and, and that's the one you're talking about, Starleaf and the Prime Minister. With the Permanent Secretary. Yes, we're hoping to do that by Starleaf, so you don't need to be there. Well, you, you know what I mean. Yes. Um, but it, we haven't quite got it working for us yet. Okay. We have to get, a, we have to get the right slot as well, apparently. So. Okay, so moving on then to item nine, is any other business? I think Claire wants yes. to come in on any other business. Yeah. Go ahead, Claire. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, this may have been discussed yesterday in relation to the FE colleges, although it is quite specific to the Northern Regional College. Um, I, I had uh, copied the committee um, into a piece of correspondence in relation to one of my constituents, but I'm concerned that it might um, affect many more um, uh, uh, constituents. So, uh, summary of the issue is, in, uh, is that the, the campus in Corian is preparing for the new build, and I think both the campuses in Balmany and Corian um, uh, finished their uh, academic year at the beginning of May, where it would normally have got run into the end of June, I believe. And um, this issue arises um, in that students have been able haven't been able to access their in uh, their education maintenance allowance um, because they haven't been in attendance through no fault of their own, because as far as they were concerned, the academic year finished at the beginning of May. I'm just concerned from a financial perspective um, that these students haven't received their full allowance, as other students would across Northern Ireland, because um, they, they've missed a number of weeks. And it could be up to six weeks you know, at £30, which is quite a lot of money, particularly you know, if, if, if you're coming from a, a background where you need that um, support. Um, I, I just I haven't received any um, response from the the department on this, um, and I had also copied it into communities who facilitate um, that. But I just I, I think there's a bit of a welfare issue in and around this. I'm also concerned that how, how this is being recorded um, in terms of their attendance. You know, ha has it been sorted out with the college that actually no, they haven't missed anything. The academic year had ended, so um, I, I just I, I, I want to put that on record with the committee because I think we have a, a role to ensure that people are getting what they're entitled to. That one up with the department. Yeah, chair, um, I've I've got note of all the issues, and we will we we do that with the department on that one. Okay, thanks, Claire. Um, okay, thanks, chair. Item number ten then is the date and time of our next meeting, which is Monday at ten a.m. in room thirty. Okay. And it's on the monitor monitoring right. round, so this will be particularly interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, you're building up here. All our meetings are interesting. Be <laughs> room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.